Nothing at all? Nope. Uh, here, plug into this guy then. Little, little, How about now? Is it any better? Now it's perfect. Okay, cool. Did all we, right. Did we already do the intro? Yes. Yeah, uh, that was I the intro. Fuck you. <laughs> Missed it. Uh, Welcome back, everybody, to uh, New Metal This is not a good way to start six. off. I already missed the intro. It's my favorite part of the show. <laughs> 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 Yeah, man. <laughs> That's, a good That's shot, it, right? yeah. yeah. That is it. We should just record that and sample that as our yeah. next intro. Yeah. Hell yeah. It's uh, watching a wrestling match without missing my favorite wrestler's intro theme. Yeah. You know, it's not, not it's as not good. Well, we got to get Code Orange to write us an intro theme. <laughs> yes, yeah. you do. They are the pinnacle uh, yeah. wrestling theme band at this point. Yeah, I guess so. What's up, everybody? We're here for new metal number six, I guess. The, right? The now? One year it is. Yeah. The one year... Fans of the show, <laughs> yeah. the one year anniversary just hit. There was an Instagram reminder of it sent to me. So that means mathematically, this is our sixth episode there of it. Go. It's Makes bi sense. monthly. I think that's the right term for it. Yep. Yeah. And I, it, it's been a blast so far. Hell yeah. It's been awesome. We're starting to really hone in yeah. on talking about things properly. The formula's there. And people are responding positively because people oh, always yeah. bring it up to me. And uh, I love it. Hell yeah. Nice. Well, here Very we cool. are. We got some, so to be back here. We got some cool records. I, I, I think I officially, I don't have the address in my head yet. I always <laughs> ask you guys for the address yeah. of this place. But I officially know where to get off the highway on 290. And then also I know to stop at Thorpe. Where do you Thorpe. get off Harlem? At, at no, there. I actually get off oh. at 25th Street. Oh. Right? Does that make, yeah. bring, make sense? Yeah. And then I stop at Thornton's and I get usually a coffee. Nice. And I, now I'm rocking, obviously, this kicker of Perrier Strawberry, which <laughs> is going to yeah. be so good. Where'd you get that at? Right, same place. Nice. Yeah. Okay. There you go. They actually have a great gas station there. Yeah. Today, I, I walked in. They were playing Mama, I'm Coming Home. Oh, and yeah. That was it. It was probably the loop. Or, does the loop? No, the loop doesn't exist yeah, anymore. The drive. <laughs> the drive. There we go. Cool. Hell yeah, that's awesome. Good to be here, guys. Yeah, fuck yeah. We got some interesting records to talk about today. To say the le- This is our most interesting episode, I would say. You think so? The lineup? Uh, maybe it's not. There. It's up there for sure. Yeah. Especially with the one that we're going to start off with from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were trying not to talk about it before you got yeah. here. Like, I'd save it, save it save for the podcast. <laughs> well, should we jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. We're starting with so, Slayer's Undisputed Attitude. That's my record. And our this biggest question is, why did you pick it? <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Slayer's Undisputed Attitude, for those of you who do you know this about this record? Because I think Bill didn't until I brought it up. That it's a cover album? Yes. I didn't until I started listening to it. Okay. So yeah. when you listen to it, at some point it clicked that this is Slayer, but it doesn't sound like Slayer. Yeah. By the oh, second yeah. song, I was like, man, this sounds like and there's it sounds like that, really punk rock. I was yeah, I, more so punky than anything. I had thought, because I I'm not I'm not very well versed in like Slayer, period. I never really I mean I I have like their older records. Like I always listen to Rain and Blood, South of Heaven, Hell Awaits, uh, Seasons in the Abyss, but I kind of fell off with them. They were never like a band that was on the forefront for me personally. Um, and I always I knew they had like a new metalish record. I was telling Bill this before we were starting here, and I had assumed I was like, oh, Eddie's probably picking the new metal one. There we go. And I like because I know there's those like there's those three records like midway in their career. The one before Undisputed Attitude, Diabolus and Musica. That's actually the one that's after Undisputed Attitude. Okay, that's the one. The I'm one thinking. before them is be uh, before Undisputed is Divine Intervention. That's what I'm thinking of too. Okay, yeah. So I know Diabolus is like the new metal ish one now. But uh, I was shocked. Yeah, by the second song, I was like, what the fuck is this? And then I, <laughs> I went to Wikipedia and I was like, oh, this is a cover record. I didn't understand. Yeah, I did not do the research. Yeah. <laughs> so Bill, when I brought it up, I said Slayer's cover record. He had this reaction like I was, the chills just went down his back. Like, what was, what? And I go, yeah, it's a cover record. 
And that will shed more light on why it sounds so different from anything Slayer related. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll get into this why I picked this in a second. First of all, I forgot my shirt of the month oh, or yeah. the episode. Got some cool my vintage. Ooh, going that's on. a good one. Yeah. This is yeah. a Cold Chamber shirt. Hell yeah. Who I think have been talked about before on the show. We've never done a Cold Chamber record. So maybe no, this is not. a teaser for something down the line. I don't know. <laughs> True. I know but, I, for one, will not be picking a Cold Chamber <laughs> album anytime soon. I was never a big fan of that. Okay. Yeah. I do like the singles, but that's. I only it. know Loco. That's the only song oh, yeah, I know. Which is one. a top 10 new metal jam of all time. Definitely. One of. And this is a little bit of a. Um, uh, foreshadowing of later, I would say that we have a song that we'll be talking about later on in this episode that is a top ten new metal song of all time. All right, all right. And then we could all think of what it what it is. I but, have a guess. Um, but yeah, this is my shirt. Cold Chamber's great. Uh, so yeah, why I picked this? All right, so this Slayer record is like I've already brought up a covers record. There is a new metal record that follows this one. It's the most new metal Slayer record. Uh, called called Diab- Diabolus and Musica, which is this arguably the dumbest Slayer title. Yeah. Um. Do you it, like that album? I, I think it's cool, and I think it it gets too much credit for being a new metal record than it actually is. Okay. People will say that's their new metal record, and if you listen to an actual new metal record, it sounds fucking nothing like okay. it. Okay, I've never heard it. For the it, record, it has a lot of groove and chunk Slayer riffs that formed what would become this next wave of slayer that we're very familiar with okay uh god hates us all yep I like and that. then all the yeah that was arguably their comeback record if yeah. you will where you said this is a great slayer record yeah and then it went from there which is the second chapter of their career hate worldwide i think was a record or a world plated blood that wasn't that okay, was one of them and yeah. then uh there was one called christ illusion yeah they followed that, that formula but this record's important for a lot of reasons, actually. Right around this time, this was released in 1995. It was done through Deaf American Records, Rick Rubin's label. Yeah. Produced by Rick Rubin. The first instinct that I had when listening to this record way back in the day was they were trying to get out of a, a record deal by just feeding them a covers record. Off of Rick Rubin's label? They were trying to get off of that? That's what I first thought, because a lot of times when you would see a record come out of nowhere, an unnecessary cover record, or unnecessary live record, there'd be a reason for it, which was just kind of trying to feed a label something and then get out of a deal, basically. Yeah. That wasn't the case with this, because they ended up doing several records with Rubin after this Oh, and his label. So that wasn't the reason, motivation behind it. Sure. What this was for me was a band that was Slayer with a distinct blueprint of being the one of the most aggressive bands in metal through the 80s, getting thrown into a new metal environment that was changing before their eyes. Sure. This is 1995 when this came out. Okay. The first four, Korn record had just come out. Oh, you, you had, okay. You had bands coming out, or I'm sorry, kind of reshuffling their own decks, yeah. maybe a band like Machine Head, and started sounding more new metal at this time. Okay. Uh, and it goes from there. Sure. So True Metal was on its way out. Okay. And Slayer is about to do a covers record, which at the time, this is, this is so strange to put it this way. This is my favorite covers record of all time, basically. And the reason is because they, this, this is, this would be the equivalent of they took songs from the late 80s, basically, and rec- sure. re-recorded them in 1995. Yeah. So do the math. What came out seven years ago, and would you make a covers record of a bunch of shit that came out seven years no, ago? No, which is very strange. So strange, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And then also, it was Slayer, to me, is hugely influenced by bands like particularly Judas Priest and yeah. Fir- First Wave of Maiden. You would expect them to maybe do a covers record of songs uh, with that shit. Sure. But there's another element to Slayer that is ever-present, which is that aggression. The, yeah. al- the album's called uh, Undisputed Attitude, and that attitude that came from the punk rock scene. Sure. And the yeah, hardcore the scene. Stuff. And then they took both elements, that Judas Priest element, and then this, and formed Slayer, basically. That yeah. was the sound. And they went back and got really ambitious with not only was 
what their version of heavy metal so passe at that time. Yeah. Or was becoming passe because everyone was sure. into corn and this newer type of group shit was that was coming in. out. Yeah. But this style of punk rock and hardcore was super passe at that time. Okay. So no one wanted to hear this at all. <laughs> and then Slayer comes out and says, fuck you, we're doing this. Yeah. Which I thought was so fucking cool. And ultimately what this did was it did usher in sort of a couple things, which is, you know, you know how this is at least what I feel. All right. This is mainly the reason why I picked it. Sure. You know how after this um, 1995 era of music, we then get hit straight with the, the meat and potatoes of new metal. 97, 98, yeah. those years. How many of those records had not only cover tracks, but the, the albums were the lead tracks were cover songs, whether it be Limp Bizkit's version of Faith. Or Orgy Blue Monday. Oh. Those were all cover tracks, yeah. and the list goes on. Mm -hmm. And when it, or uh, Cold Chamber doing on their first record, uh, the uh, Sway, which is the roof, the roof, oh, yeah. the roof is on fire. They just did all this shit. And I would say, I'm not sure they were very influenced by it, but it took Slayer making a avant garde cover record yeah. to kind of lay that blueprint. Because before that, I really didn't hear a lot of those. If they were cover songs, they were traditional versions of it. Sure. If you listen to the original versions of this uh, Slayer record, yeah, they don't sound anything like they sound like Slayer infused hardcore songs yeah. on this record. The original versions sound nothing like that. Very low fi sure. low produced, and the key is this: the execution was poor because they were a bunch of punk rock kids doing it. Yeah, and I thought that's why this record is so fucking rad. Yeah, the track listing. Let's get into it, and I'm sure we'll talk about hardcore <laughs> and uh kind of how it plays into the hardcore scene that at least from what I knew it growing up in Chicago. This record if you if you first of all anyone who is into hardcore at all should really really listen to this record. It is compiled of first of all they totally do a faux pas right off the bat which is they <laughs> record multiple ver uh Songs by the same band. Yeah, I've noticed that. They minor threat. A couple minor threat songs, a couple bands or songs by the band DI. Yeah. Uh, and it go there's a, another one I'm missing too. Verbal abuse. They do a few from them. Yeah. But here's the key to this, which is if you know anything about hardcore and uh its origins, if you we probably all brush shoulders with the Chicago hardcore scene at one point. All these bands that were covered by Slayer. We're from uh, particularly the West Coast, Texas. I mean, not Minor Threat. They were an East Coast band. Texas, uh, Southern California, hardcore, all around where Slayer grew up. And honestly, all due respect to the Chicago hardcore scene and the one that we know and grew up with, no one in that scene at all gave a fuck about any of those bands or knew anything about them. Sure. They only knew what would be New York hardcore and after. Okay. Pro Mags, Agnostic Front, and they just ripped off that blueprint. Mm -hmm. Slayer really took advantage of that first wave of hardcore and punk and said, this is what influenced us to be as aggressive as we are. Mm -hmm. And then you have this cover record. Sure. Which I think is really fucking badass. Yeah. And it's kind of like the new metal tie where when they started a band like Orgy doing Blue Monday, for example. They were influenced by the band. I want to say New Order is the band that did Blue Monday originally. Okay. But they were influenced by that new wave, like, aesthetic. And sure. then that like became... The mode and shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, shit like that. So that became, let's fucking work this into what we do. And this is okay. kind of an apparent influence. Sure. It, yes, I get it. It's a little... Orgy uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Or, like, Limp... I don't... I don't. It's weird that <laughs> Limp is going to do Faith and there's yeah. any kind of a connection. But... This record, um, also, it's it sounds so good. It has it's the first record start to finish that you have Paul Bostaff on. Yeah, weird. Oh, okay. Who fucking destroys at drums and also is yeah, he's good. He's they're so lucky that they caught lightning in a bottle twice with having Lombardo. They actually had a different drummer, uh, John Denny, do oh. do drums for the record you mentioned before that, which is called. Um, uh, Divine, Intervention? Divine Intervention. Okay. And then was that guy in any bands? Any other bands? No, but he was uh tried out and he made it apparently to the finals when Lombardo left the second time. Oh, okay. So the, it was down to basically Bo Staff and this thing John <laughs> back in the band, right where they started from. Yeah. And 
They picked Bo Staff again. Wow. And Bo Staff ended up killing it until the band essentially broke up and yeah, played their last yeah. show. But Bo Staff is fucking a phenomenal drummer, mm-hmm. and he has a skill that is very... Um, Lombardo is uh, very uh, straightforward with his playing. Mm-hmm. The uh, thrash beats are, like, really precise, that whole thing. Bo Staff will throw in, like, these junky fills that honestly i hear when i hear any type of new metal bands sure which is like that like junky like dead fill blum, blum, you know, it's just <laughs> yeah. that bullshit so i don't know if they were influenced by bo staff at this point or whatever but his drumming always strikes me as the perfect guy to take slayer into the new later 90s chapter of sure. their not that lombardo couldn't have killed it but yeah. bo staff was the guy for that time sure the song i picked was a song called gemini which is the last yeah, song on the record. The only original the song. The only original song, and that is arguably the... I love Slayer. I really, really do. Yeah. But if you ask me if if uh, my top 10 records of all time, Slayer will not appear in it. Sure. But, and this is what's awesome about that band, they have my number one cover records of all time. I'm not going to tell you my number two, but they're neck and neck. Okay. Maybe I'll save that for another show sometime. But my number one covers record of all time is this one. Really? My number one, my number one live album of all time is the double album called Decade of Aggression. Okay, which came out in '94, has Lombardo on it, and it's just Slayer being Slayer. It's so awesome. Yeah, and it's recorded over I think two shows. So Slayer has my favorite live album of all time, my favorite covers record of all time. Other than that, again, love their regular catalog, but it doesn't make it into my probably my top ten ever. But uh, this record is. Um, one thing that's important to mention is, again, the hardcore bands they choose are these bands that are, they have their stereotypical abbreviation names. EI is one of them. Uh, <laughs> T- TSOL, yeah. they do one of those songs. DRI. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's one I'm missing. T- oh, they do. Don't they do a Stooges song? They, they do do a Stooges song. Yeah. There was there's two tracks that were scrapped from the record that are okay. online that are like in the Digipack version. Oh. Uh, which is uh, one of them's uh, by Suicidal. Okay. And then one of them's by GBH, another <laughs> initial band. Yeah. But these are bands that again, when I was growing up in the hardcore scene, I was really stoked to talk, and I didn't grow up in the hardcore scene, and we'll probably get to that in a second. A lot of people and podcasts, wherever they always poke around about my history and my involvement in that scene. Because if people don't realize, I used to run fucking shows, and I really cut my teeth doing shows, A, at DePaul, and booking sort of pseudo-hardcore shows. Mm -hmm. Bill just mentioned a show I I was involved in back in the day when I booked Tony Danza for the first time in Chicago. Oh. My band opened. Nice. (laughs) Where was that at, DePaul? No, it's now a defunct place. It was was in Rogers Park at um, The Space. Wow. Right? That was the name of the venue, maybe? The one I played there twice, and it changed names. It changed names, yeah. Now, yeah. if, anyone, if anyone remembers, yeah. there was a... Um, Where was it, like, in Rogers? There's a there's a strip right of... tracks. I remember yeah, that. there's a downtown Rogers Park strip, which is the worst strip. It's a horrible downtown area, but it hugs, like, this one weird Alcovey street. Okay. And that's where it was. Cobblestone Road, super hard to park. There was a movement at one point where a lot of shows were going up to that area, and kids just refused to leave... The comforts of the Logan Square area. Sure. They're, they said this is where the venues need to be. We're more wow. comfortable hanging out here than having to drive up to Rogers Park and do it and can't find parking. We don't like hanging on Rogers Park. And then before you know it, all these venues started popping up in some shape or form in Logan, Wicker Park, West Loop. Sure. And the rest is history. Yeah, that sucks. I wish there was venues in Rogers Park now. They I would tried love it. that. They tried it so much, and we'll talk about Chicago Hardcore in a second. Yeah. The only venue that was able to su- sustain itself and being a destination venue was Knights of Columbus. All oh, those there? years. Was there one up there? Yeah, in Arlington oh. Heights. You ever been oh, to a show Arlington there? Heights, yeah. So, yeah, you know what I'm saying, there. as far as a remote location goes. Oh, okay. Because other than that, they tried putting venues in that had consistent metal, hardcore, new metal shows, whatever, in Wrigleyville, failed. They tried to do shows at Cubby Bear. Mm-hmm. They tried to do shows in the Rogers Park area. And they tried to do shows, um, like, in um, what would be the wet, uh, Aurora, basically. Oh, okay. They did, there was that venue, whoever and probably remembers, called Riley's Rock House. Yeah. I and remember Doug's in Aurora, Doug's, too. That's what I'm saying, which yeah. is they closed down and the same people opened up Doug's. Oh, and then okay. people... 
said this will be maybe the next Riley's and it never took off yeah. because people just focused on we want to really have shows in this one area and the only one that will that was grandfathered in was sort of the Knights of Columbus yeah and those had shows until literally it stopped having shows because the people said it's not worth us having the show it's usually accompanied by a fight or some bullshit or it's destroyed <laughs> That what happened was at the parking lot. The main, the main promoter for that obviously was Shane Merrill for so many years. At Doug's? No, at well, he did some Doug shows too oh, for okay. sure, but it was mainly Knights of Columbus. He okay. that was his venue in Arlington Heights. In Arlington Heights. Wow. Okay. And then I remember I I worked for Shane and I ran door between. I didn't run door. There was a I was carting people to get into the bar for years, and not a bad gig because all I would do is card people, which it was that position was needed. Because they couldn't have kids going in the bar. And ironically enough, I was under 21 carding people. But uh, <laughs> uh, the funny thing is, we were, I would sit there, get paid, card people, and then uh, watch a band. Yeah. Close yeah. and close, because the stage nice. was right there. Yeah. You know, that's not a bad way to make a, uh, not a living, but, you know, pizza and beer money yeah, when you're that, yeah. when you're 20. It's awesome. I, and, so many great stories, and I saw so many bands that I wouldn't have seen sure. because it was stuff that I was I wouldn't leave my house for. You know, if I ended up being there, great. Mm -hmm. But I saw so many great bands, and it was a really, really good time. But when it came down to it, again, you meet these hardcore kids, and yeah. I was into this style of hardcore. There was a couple bands that I wish Slayer would have uh, touched and fucked with on this record. I'm glad they did the DRI song. Uh particularly Dead Kennedys. If everyone knows Jeff Hanneman, the late Jeff Hanneman, he always had a Dead Kennedy sticker on his Slayer guitars. Oh, cool. Big Dead Kennedys fan. They didn't do one on the record. But I would try to talk to kids that were in the Chicago hardcore scene back in the day about bands like DRI, about bands like DI, about bands like uh, like Dead Kennedys, for example, sure. and no one fucked with them. Everyone really? said, yeah, no, I don't really know those bands. And I'm saying, you're into hardcore, right? And then I realized that, listen, man, people will prod me about this, but the Chicago hardcore scene in so many ways was a fucking sh sham in a lot of ways. It was fake. It was just all, you liked three styles of bands that were particularly from New York, and then you, you, they just ripped them all off. Mm. And then, ironically enough, I kind of called it, which was all those kids eventually, all due respect to them, at one point or another grew out of it and took their balls and went home. Yeah. So <laughs> it was all about we're at a, there was a big straight edge culture and I had no problems with that whatsoever. Sure. But they all dropped it and they all got real lives and moved out to whatever burbs and, you know, posted up there. They don't po uh, go to those. Those same bands are touring still. You could still see a band like 100 Demons who are amazing. Oh, yeah. Come through every now and again when there's not COVID or whatever. Those kids don't go out to the shows anymore. And it's ironic that. All the kids that were wrapped up in whatever scene. I mean, I fucking ran into Bill, or I'm sure like he's my age or whatever, at fucking gigs back then. He's still going to gigs. Mm -hmm. They're all still going to gigs supporting the other side of it, which is more of the straight up heavy metal type deal. They never fucking sure. stopped. And it, they it's not that we don't live in the burbs and do that whole thing too, and we haven't aged and done that thing, but we didn't just drop and say we're done with it. Sure. You know? So and I'm trying, but it's it's yeah, it's hard, right? Thank God for COVID, but go on. <laughs> Uh, the other side of it too, which I find funny is that I, again, would try to talk with people in Chicago hardcore about these sort of West coast bands. No one fucked with them. And then another thing too, is I got, I wouldn't get, I never got shit on from anyone once in the Chicago hardcore scene. But one thing I, that did happen was I would roll up to these shows consistently and kind of like, I'll be frank with you. I haven't really changed my style in like 20 years sure i always was kind of like a cardigan flannel dude i always wore grunge or new metal t-shirts <laughs> uh i always wore jeans and maybe vans that sure. whole thing maybe spearies which i always wear now nice. and then what happened was that hardcore scene god bless them there was a very distinct look to it which is the fat, flat brim, brim cap oh yeah the long sleeve shirt the wearing shorts even though it's uh 30 degrees outside <laughs> and the nike air force ones and then ironically enough somewhere down the line those kids, particularly the climate controllers of that scene, started rolling up with longer hair like me. Maybe they grew a hipster mustache. Maybe they wore a typo shirt and a flannel and jeans and vans. I'm like, where'd y'all get that look? Then it was kind of like, we're not going for that New York style look yeah. even more. 
now we're kind of biting this pseudo grunge style, which basically was yeah. the door dude at Nice Columbus <laughs> for a lot of years. Not saying they distinctly ripped me off, but sure. I was definitely rock and look prior to that, you know? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm driving at is anytime someone would feel kind of, un- it was a very easy scene and hardcore to feel uncomfortable with, uh, I would always be like, why? I'm These kids don't even listen to this, yeah. like, seminal shit. Yeah. And I don't really see them liking this music. They like hip-hop a lot, which is, rat- like, sure. Three Six Mafia or whatever is <laughs> yeah. one of their favorites. Or hate breed, stuff mm-hmm. like that. But it's not something to be intimidated by because they yeah. really don't come from... They liked Blink-182 growing up. Yeah. Isn't that so weird, man? I've been noticing this 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 trend in death metal of, like, all these new bands that are coming up that are trying to sound, like, old school. And then I'll look into it. I'm like, oh, these guys are yo- either, A, younger than me, and I'm 29. But, like, still, it's kind of like, what? I don't play old school death metal. And that was before my time. And then, like... I, it's just it, I look in like I look into these guys older bands I'm like oh they came from hardcore bands or they came from pop punk bands and I'm like what like why is it all of a sudden cool now to wear like vintage Morbid Angel like shirts and- you know what you want to hear about something that is listen man we could we could go down this this uh road and sound like the most bitter motherfuckers ever that our <laughs> styles were bit yeah. and there's some truth to it I'm not bitter about it I'm yeah. just calling a spade a spade you got to call it right down the fucking middle yeah what happened was this which is those dudes say for example you were in a band that was a ripoff of attack attack yeah all right okay it doesn't get more metal <laughs> and seen and and sticky and bullshitty than yeah. that you were you had a swoop haircut you had a white belt <laughs> your pants were girls pants yeah. and you were usually trying to fit 20 pounds into a 10 pound bag of potatoes you know yeah. what I'm saying uh, so when it came down to it, that's what you were ripping off first. Yeah. Great. Now, maybe you are the band that was the only band in your respective pseudo city suburb doing it. Maybe you were from an area of Ohio that is call it Youngstown, Ohio. We just brought that up the other day. Yeah. So that's an area that it's its own thing. Okay. So when X band comes through from a second story window comes through Youngstown, who the fuck are they going to get to play opening for them? that band and yeah. you do that every fucking time a big band plays you get it because you're kind of the the pool the pool is shallow sure so you're going to do that and you're going to get a little bit of a track traction sure because if every show you're playing is pseudo slammed and yeah. you're the local hero people are going to notice you yep so that happens and you get a little bit of traction with that shit and before you know it the white belt thing maybe molds into we're going to take off the white belts and do more of like a traditional more hate breeds look like look like hate breed a little bit more Mm -hmm. you know and that's a that's a little harder you know the winter coats and the fucking they ain't they're not wearing white belts you know no yeah. and then what happens is you organically have a harder sound with that sure and then you say oh man these kids or these fans or whatever are really reacting to the heavier parts sure. more than anything. The breakdowns, if you will, like time to sit at the fuck off, that whole thing. Yeah. So when you are get done raping hate breed or all those <laughs> bands for their breakdowns and the things, where do you go from there? Well, I saw this metal dude looking super fucking hard. You know, let's check into this shit. And that's when you, bands like Cannibal Corpse and Dying Fetus yeah. become the most raped bands and ripped off bands because they had these insane slam parts that... People are like, go there, mimic yeah. it. So then you have this band that's attack, attack, now looking and sounding more like Cannibal Corpse every day. Yeah. And then I, again, <laughs> sounding like an OG, the first time I saw Cannibal Corpse was like, what, 98? Oh, wow. When you're in a situation where you see that crowd go from people who are straight up death metal dudes yeah. who have been there since, you know, since the jump back in 1990, basically. And then. You now see kids rolling up post scene kids with uh, whatever gauges and shit at cannibal shows. Sure. And I'm not ripping on them. That's how cannibal got this new breath of life in them and yeah. got this whole second. Oh, the, yeah. Because there these new fans came out on the pike that like the newer cannibal just as much as the, as the old cannibal, yeah. which is essentially with any band is unheard of. People yeah. will always say the original shit's better. But now these uh, these newer bands are saying. Gore obsessed and fucking uh, wretched spawn and yeah. all these new kill are just as influential to me as for me butchered at birth were or was, like Tomb of the Mutilated, or Tomb of the shit. Mutilated which yeah. was the OG awesome shit. But it's all because they got this new wave of fans that were essentially attack attack dudes. Yeah, I you know? dude, I when I first heard of Cannibal Corpse, I was listening to like they had to be the heaviest thing at the time for me. I was listening to like I don't know 
uh, Pantera and like Metallica. And then I heard like I saw Metal of Headbangers Journey and saw all, that documentary. And I oh, saw yeah. all the that was shit such about a Pam- fun documentary. Yeah, and I saw that all- Canadian dude. Yeah, yeah, the guy who does head. Ba- uh, what is it? Fucking Nate and Ray were on it. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Um, I always forget. My buddy works for them. Um, fuck. What are they called? Shit. It's right on the t- tip of my tongue here. I'm going to look it up because I don't want to sound ignorant. <laughs> I saw it, Nate and Ray do it. When I uh, when I first got into Cannibal Corpse, and I'm, this, I was younger. I was probably in like seventh grade or si- yeah, probably seventh or eighth grade when I first started getting into Cannibal Corpse and Kill was about to come out. Sure. And like so my introduction to them was like, all right, I went to Rolling Stones. I got the Wretched Spawn and I got Tomb of the Mutilated and the Bleeding. So I had like... Two older records. Those are just so great, Yeah, man. they're all good. And I was just like, whoa, this is the shit. And then Kill came out, and I was like, oh, my God. This yeah. is super, you know, aggressive. But um, it's just, yeah. And it's, But you're right, though, because, like, now you see bands like, you know, when Cannibal put out their last record, I want to say on their first headlining tour, they brought out Gate Creeper, who's, like, a huge, trendy band now. Yes, absolutely. You know, they're, like, the br- blueprint for that shit. Those guys were probably all in pop punk bands or hardcore bands that are now, like, I doing bet. a death metal thing. And they came out of, I want to say... Maybe like Arizona, yeah, Gate, Keep, Gate Creeper, yeah, something like that. Uh, it was funny because once I realized that hardcore was going a strange direction was when I saw and I forget what band it was, man. They opened they, Banger TV. That's what they're called. Sorry, Banger TV. Yeah, there was one incident where I saw a band open up their show. This was very, very common in hardcore, which was yeah. they would open up a show with a riff that wasn't essentially theirs. Oh. Sort of like how Dead to Fall, for example, plays, th- this is theirs, that intro, da 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 bomp ba da bomp ba da bomp and this is rad. But they would open up with, uh, maybe it would be the intro of, if anyone's a Stormtrooper of Death Band, March of the SOD, everyone knows that intro, or something along those okay. lines, or um, Among the Living or something. But I saw a band open up with that that's uh legendary dying a hardcore band yeah open up with that legendary dying fetus riff that's really? the intro which is bam 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 and i go i go i don't know what's going on right now because <laughs> yeah. like worlds are colliding like george would say and the funny thing is most of these kids here don't know that's dying fetus yeah but that is dying fetus is all hell yeah. and that's a legendary death metal riff <laughs> Which is that's the fuck. first thing I think of when I hear of dying. When yeah, I think that's of dying a fucking fetus, legendary. First, yeah, <laughs> that band rules so hard. So yeah, like I'm saying, around this time when uh, hardcore bands started to get harder, they would dying fetus were ripped off to sh- like uh, to no end. Oh, I'm sure. Cannibal Corpse. There's the list goes on. You know. Yeah. And it was all to just be harder. You yeah. know. And I I believe that bands that were uh, attack attack would feel more empowered playing the harder riffs. Yeah. That ought, were you know available with Cannibal Corpse with that whole thing, and then the thing too is this, which is they're still catering to like the hardcore pseudo hardcore crowd. Sure. So they're not uh, having to get analyzed by death metal purists like you're fucking <laughs> yeah. being idiots right now and just ripping off bullshit. There's yeah. borrowing from it, and then you're fine because you're still catering to your own crowd, mm-hmm. you know. And then you look like the hardest motherfucker in front of this crowd, but it's a different crowd, you know. Sure. Yeah. Interesting how that all works. I really like this record, and uh, I know this was the uh, I know this was the weird avant garde pick, and I know you guys probably hate it. I don't like, but it was, <laughs> you know, like I said, I didn't hate Sorry. it. I didn't I didn't hate it. Uh, first off, I'll say I didn't know any of these songs from this record. Yeah, I didn't know any. I've never listened to punk much or a lot of hardcore. That's not like obvious, like hate breed type stuff. Sure. Like I'm not super well versed in that world. So like when I started listening to this, I was like, cool, a Slayer record I haven't heard before. So Put on the first song. I was taking a shower yesterday, and I was listening to it, and I was like, wow, this is, like, really thrashy for, like, Slayer. And I was like, that's kind of cool. And then, like, I started listening to the lyrics on the second song, and I was like, man, this is getting weird. Like, this doesn't really feel like Slayer. Yes. And then, like, I went on Wikipedia, and I was like, what does it say? And I'm like, oh, this is all covers except Gemini, the last song on the record, which is a weird song, man. Oh, it's the... I might have started talking about this. That is the deep cut of D Cups for Slayer songs yeah. that people love. Because it has almost a vibe where it's... It's like Doomy at the beginning. Doomy, and then Araya has a vocal arrangement that he's never fucked with, which yeah, is... Yeah, almost kind singing. Of, yeah, singing and lethargic. Yeah. Uh, like, almost... Weird. Early Ozzy, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And that's awesome. And people love that song. And yeah. I still... I used to play that when I DJed back in the day. I Gemini. was always... 
Gemini is always a jam. Yeah. And rad fucking tune, man. The, the groove is just awesome. I'm so glad it made that. Do they ever they, play they, that? They, I don't think they've ever played it live. Oh, wow. Really, really good song. But uh, the, the record itself, I think, sounds great. Sure. And it sounds... Uh, the one thing I... And I'm so stoked that I got to re-listen to this record and talk about this going into what Bill and I are going into the studio this week to record, start recording the yeah. third Something is Waiting record. I could totally tell when I hear this record, the Slayer record, that everyone in the band is having fun with it. Yeah. Mainly, and I've never heard this before more from him, Tom Araya. He's doing things, if you listen to the original version, he's adding little bits and pieces of his own flavor into it. Oh, cool. And you will, when you're not having fun with something, you're saying, all right, this is what I've been tasked to do. Sure. Just give me the fucking lyrics. Let me just get it out. But he's throwing little fun, fun little cadences and uh -huh. tricks into it and changing little things up. Yeah. He's having a fucking blast with it. Sure. And his vocals are, they, I, I would say... Tom Araya after this starts really becoming a great vocalist on metal records mm -hmm. right after this record up until that point. If you listen to, you know, I like rain and blood a lot, a lot. It's mm -hmm. a, you know, but the vocals are not the strongest as far as what's presented to me on that record. It's more agree. just like an attack of thrash. Everything. Yeah. It's just an attack. Yeah. But after this, Tom becomes a great, great heavy metal vocalist. Yeah. This is the first one, I think. This is his first would, great vocal performance. I would agree with you there because I... Listen to God Hates Us All. The vocals yeah, on that yeah. are unbelievable. Dude, my, my introduction to Slayer was through fucking Grand Theft Auto Vice City because <laughs> Raining Blood is in the soundtrack. It's sure. on V-Rock. And That's I awesome. remember I was at Eric's house and we were we were playing it in his bedroom. And like he was like, yeah, this is Slayer. And I was like, holy fuck, this <laughs> is nuts. And this was back in the day where Eric didn't have a computer so, like, we had our iPods, like our classic <laughs> iPods that had, like, 64 gigs on them. He would come over to my house and use my computer. We would go to the library and just get stacks of CDs and rip them onto my computer and put them on our iPods. That's how we would discover a lot of new music. Definitely. And God Hates Us All was, like, the newest Slayer record at the time. So we were just like, fuck, like, this looks cool. Like, we saw it, and I remember putting it in and hearing the song God Hates Us All and just being like, wow, this is, like, a lot different than Raining Blood. Which and I mean, you know, that that was that was the newest Slayer record when I had heard of Slayer, when I was aware that mm. they were a band was God Hates Us All. And like that's I, I still to this day, that's usually what I do is if I discover a band, I try to list like their most recent piece of music. And then I'll, especially, you know, metal bands, it's like the classic formula is like they have the bands have the one record that's amazing. You know, like every band's got like a quintessential record. They're like, this is the best one. So I always like to go listen to the new one. And then I always go for the best one. And I, I feel like raining or rain in blood is like the most talked about slayer record at yeah. least you know it's like the record for them coming out in 1986 when that came yeah. out it was ahead of its time and then slayer is the number one in let me put it this way they are the number one mainstream influence yeah. on underground music ever i i say slayer is a mainstream metal band i really do because they're they're signed agree. they're signed to a major a major label yeah. The tours they were on, uh, the, they're up there in the conversation with the top 10 metal bands of all time. Oh, yeah. Be behind your Maidens, Priest, Sabbath, whatever, Pantera, Lysos, they're right up there. Yeah. And they influenced the grindcore, de death metal for sure. Scene. Oh, yeah. I mean, Cannibal Corpse is like Slayer just amped up. I know. You know? And, and like more gross. Even, even though all those kids liked Metallica, the blueprint for them was Slayer. Oh, yeah. It says, do what Slayer is doing, but take it up a fucking notch. Oh, hell and yeah. And then new scenes developed. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, it is cool. Very cool, yeah. Yeah, it's very influential. I mean, and so like, influential. I was always, you know, like, I don't know of a ton. I mean, I guess off the top of my head, I don't know of a ton of metal cover records. Like, the first one that always pops to my head is Garage Inc., which is probably yep. my favorite cover. Album really good one. metal band. Yeah. And then that's, uh, that's another reason why I picked this, which was it's so weird that they... Metallica covered songs. The majority of those songs that Metallica covered are songs from the 70s, basically, yeah. which makes sense because they're going back 20 years, essentially, when they're yep. doing this record in the late 90s. Yep. So they're covering Stone Cold Crazy by Queen or fucking uh, Turn the Page by Bob Seger. Yeah. Uh, and there was a, a, whatever. It's all 70s shit, basically. Yeah. They and did Merciful Fate. They did Merciful Fate, which yeah. is early 80s. Yeah. That was like as, as it, you know... Uh, they actually, one of their biggest songs, too, was probably influenced by the Slayer record on that record, which was So What? It was oh, yeah. another West Coast punk. It was actually an England punk song okay. by, um, I forget what band it was, but uh, anti Nowhere League, I think. Okay. But besides that, it's all 70s shit, and so it sure. makes sense. Yeah. 
And this one just in no way makes sense. Yeah, it's very strange. And it's inter- I guess I want to ask, um, you know, to like close out the chapter on this record is like, what do you think made them go from doing a record like, and I've still not yet to hear Diabolus, so I can't say much about sure. it. But like, what do you think? You know, they did this. Obviously, it sounds like they did it as a defiant move to what was big that was going on. Totally defiant. What do you think made them go more in that? I mean, I don't know if it really does sound new metal, but more in that direction for Diabolic. Yeah, I think it was. There's a big. You think they were finally just like, fuck it, let's do it. There's a big song. I, I think it's really easy. There's yeah. a big song on the best song. The most known song on Diabolus is a song called Stain of Mine. Okay. Not State of Mine. Stain, Stain of, of Mine. Mind. And the riff is the stereotypical 90s new metal riff. Da na 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 Which is in every new metal band's record multiple times usually. I'd argue they were trying to do this and it, it succeeded, which is sometimes when there's a scene that is so, such a juggernaut in your, there's a, metal's a subculture. There's a scene going on that is such a fucking force right now that you have to fuck with it just a little bit in order to stay relevant and keep your name sure. in the fucking press. Yeah. During this time, Slayer was able to tour when Diabolus came out. With They took out all the cool new metal bands. They went on tour with System of Down, Fear Factory, all these bands. They did the OzFest. You have a slew of new metal bands opening up the fest. Limp Bizkit, all this shit. But snot. And then you have Slayer as one of the, not headliners, but pretty close to the end. Then you have like Sabbath, Primus, whatever, yeah. and they were able to stay relevant. And then guess what? As soon as everyone's kind of on to the next thing after new metal and true metal is about to come back around, that's when God Hates Us All comes out. And that was a defining true traditional metal record mm-hmm. for the next generation. Yeah. And everyone loved it. Yeah. You know, that was that was arguably the I mean, it's a top, it might be a top four popularity wise Slayer record ever. Yeah, and that do- that means we're cutting out some of the early shit then. Sure, because people point to that just like they point not as much to Rain and uh, Rain and Blood, but it's up there. Yeah, the newer generation just love that record because it's fucking awesome and it sounds so great. Mm-hmm. And it was a big fucking deal when it came out. Yeah. It was the first Slayer record in, I think it came out in 2001, and it was the first Slayer record in about four years. Yeah, I, I saw them open up. Yeah, for didn't pe- it come out right around 9 11? It, it, mm-hmm. it came out, I think, on 9 11. Wow. Jesus. This is a re- reoccurring topic. <laughs> yeah, in this episode. on the show. Yeah, yeah, which is the 9 11 day of what, what yeah. albums are released. Wow. God Hates Us All comes out on 9 11. <laughs> Holy fuck. Yeah. Yeah, that had to make somebody upset. I'm sure somewhere. This is. Uh, Bill, what are your thoughts on this record? I know Sorry. you probably hate it. No, I liked it. No, that's fine. I like Slayer. I not like the. <laughs> do you like Slayer? Yeah, I do like Slayer. <clears throat> and um, uh, yeah, it just threw me off because yeah, I was listening to it. I was like, this doesn't sound like Slayer that I know. Yeah, and not yes. that like like you like I'm not huge like sure. I don't know their like the, you know everything about them, but it, like hearing it, I'm like this is weird. And then some of it, I was like, some of this sounds familiar. Like. Some of the hooks in those songs, I was like, man, they sound so familiar. I was like, I don't know where they're coming mm-hmm. from. And then you mentioned, you're like, oh, the covers. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you could tell it's if all you listen, coming together. If you were to listen to Bill and I ba- I's band, something is waiting. That sticky tongue in cheek aspect of what Slayer cover on this record, yeah, is I'm deep rooted in it from a lyrical standpoint. I write all my shit like that. Yeah. So there's this one of my favorite songs on this record is um the cover. Uh, they're all covers besides the last one. Richard hung himself. If you okay. remember that one, it's towards the end. Yeah. And it's a tongue in cheek song about suicide, essentially, which you can't even fuck with now, obviously. Sure. But it's an interesting song because back in the eighties, you could fuck with whatever the fuck you want. You could talk like the Sex Pistols did about abortion and shit, and like a sure. fun, sticky way in the song Bodies. But they all fucking did it. And this is what influenced those dudes. Sure. You know, to be kind of themselves. But yeah. they were like, they carved their own niche and said, not that we were going to do the tongue in cheek aspect, but we were going to talk about whatever the fuck we wanted to and fuck everyone else. Yeah. You know, uh, they, there is a suicidal song I mentioned that got scrapped on the record. It's on the, it's a B side or I'm a digi pack bonus or whatever, if you, if you will. Tom Mariah was a huge suicidal tendencies fan. Cool. I want to say his, um, He's in, there's a big video uh, for Suicidal uh, called Institutionalized. I think it's that yeah. one. And Tom Mariah's in it. Oh, cool. He's like, he's like a 13-year-old kid at a backyard party. And you oh, can see him. Oh, wow. really? Yeah. That's wild. That's cool. Are they older than Slayer's Suicidal Tendencies? Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, they were, call it 18 when Tom Mariah was like 13. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So, so they were the influence, yeah. you know? And no I, I, they just love that old school punk 
hardcore sound sure. from the West Coast. That makes sense. Really fucking cool. Yeah. Uh, if you listen to, I will say this, if there's a band that a lot of bands, particularly the most popular one is probably like a band like Municipal Waste right now, took whatever this, I, I'm sure if you talk with those dudes, they were influenced by this record, this yeah. cover record. Because the whole thing is taking an aggressive, basic, hardcore element under two minute songs, whatever, and having it sound fucking good. Yeah. And also, when you hear punk rock guitar and it's or hardcore guitar, old hardcore, it's it's all down picking. Yeah. Na 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 na. Whatever. And just with that, there, uh, dynamic suffer. Slayer doesn't do that. They do. Yeah. <laughs> and they fucking shred the shit out of these songs. Yeah. And then when you listen to a band like Municipal Waste, they do it that way. Yeah. And that's fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, a, cool. it's a metal attack on uh old hardcore basically. Yeah. And it's cool. Now, uh Municipal Ways, a band like them wouldn't fuck with the lyrics like these old school hardcore bands. They're more <laughs> like party, like let's rage, that yeah. whole thing. That's where they get their own sound, but it's definitely based around it, this sounds like um, what a Municipal Ways record would sound like. Sure. Yeah. So, I think this record is dude, it's not even underrated. People just don't don't fucking know about it. Yeah. People will be uh that one went over my head mm -hmm. and I'm saying you love Slayer and you've seen them 13 times live and you don't know this record exists. Yeah. What the fuck are you doing? Very and weird. it was released just like every other Slayer record. Sure. And they toured for it. I don't know if there's any footage of them online playing any of these songs live. That's the only okay. thing I don't know. Do they because not play any of those currently nope. or did they? Ne I've never seen them play anything. Okay. Uh, their catalog is vast and sure. not to mention the fans spoke and they said, even if we think this record's rad, we, we're not hanging our hats on this. We are going to hang our hats on Rain and Blood, Seasons in the Abyss, yeah. the new shit that we love. And before you know it, that's a whole set. Yeah, yeah, you know? makes sense. They don't need to play fucking these songs. Yeah. But it's a really fucking cool, criminally underrated cover record yeah, that no cool. one fucking talks about. And it's right in the fucking thick of, again, new metal. I yeah. will never pick a record that's uh, not in the thick of it. Sure. You know, so 1995... Again, yeah, first corn that, record, yeah. all this shit. That was the time and place, you know? Yeah. But cool little record for sure. Hell yeah. I think everyone should check it out. And I will say this, which is I hear when I hear bands like, or when I hear this, go back and uh, listen to the Slayer record, I, listen, I think of Thieves, the band. Oh, oh yeah. And I, uh, what they do is, I, I hope those dudes li listen to this record. And if not, they should. Yeah. But I hear a sound, which is that chaotic hardcore in it. Oh, yeah. And... You know, I talked for a little bit about the old hardcore scene, and I will say this. This is why I love Thieves so much. Those dudes were in that scene. Yeah. And they were called fucking Thieves. They yeah. were Thieves. Yeah. And it's just, they stuck with it. Yeah. And all those bands around them that were maybe even a little more popular than them at the time all went by the wayside. Yeah. And I love so much. I have so many great memories of seeing bands like The Killer play because they were fucking so sure. unbelievable. Chains band, right? Chains band, yeah. They were unbelievable, man. And the energy in that room was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, now, it had to do with the fact that some of their fans were weird, like, uh, I'm a pipe fitter from fucking, you know, uh, whatever, <laughs> yeah. Mount Prospect, and I'm going to come and fuck, every <laughs> fuck everyone's shit up while, while wearing a scarf Scarface, the, mo yeah. the movie all, shirt, yeah. you know? But... <laughs> <laughs> what I'm driving at is that's why Thieves is always going to be one of my bands from that scene because they're one of the ones that survived and they did it fucking right and they always yeah. had a chaotic element that bands wouldn't fuck with. Yeah. But Slayer fucks with on this record. The yeah. cha chaoticness of hardcore. Yeah, which is cool. Very cool. So shout out to Thieves. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I don't think I ever would have listened to this record probably ever if, unless we picked it from right. this. I know, <laughs> I and I ever believe me, it was a tough it. call and that's why I was wrestling with it. Yeah. But I wanted to, my main goal with this one, and it's weird to start the show talking about this because we're about to wrap this portion of it, was to literally just put more ears on this record. Yeah, that's cool. Just fucking listen to it, and you're going to like it. You yeah. really are, and you're going to, if you take it for what it is, and you say it's a little bit of a history lesson, and it's dudes that already fucking blew the doors open with their own style of music saying, we're going to show some love to what influenced us. And it's not going to be who you think, which would yeah. be, again, the Priest, Maiden, Sabbath covers, all this bullshit. They yeah. avoided that. They went so true with it. And also, the final thing with this, which is Jeff Hanneman's old band, a band called Pap Smear, yeah. was... Two of the songs on the record. They yeah, recorded. Yeah. So imagine you guys being in a rad band, which you guys both been in, but pre your previous band and going back to them and say, we're going to take a couple songs and fucking redo this shit. <laughs> yeah. We heard the other day we, we were jamming and Gabe should be not thinking about playing psycho scapegoat songs 
<laughs> which was mine and Gabe's old bands from yeah. back in the day. But he was jamming on some scapegoat shit, Gabe, yeah. the, the other day, two days ago or yesterday. And it'd be like taking those scapegoat songs and having something is waiting to it. Yeah. It'd be awesome. We wouldn't do it ever. <laughs> but it's still fucking cool. Yeah, it's cool. I think that would be cool if you guys did that. That'd be fun. Please check out this record, fan base of yeah. nothings for no one. <laughs> yeah, it's check really, it out. really cool. And attitude. it's worth it. And it sounds great. And it's a fun listen. It's a quick listen, too. It is a quick listen. They're all under two minute songs. Yeah, dude. Especially compared to the records me and Bill picked, it's definitely a oh, quick listen. And we'll segue, <laughs> we'll segue into that. We'll, <laughs> yeah. Dude, we'll segue into whatever the next one is right now. But what the fuck, dude? You guys got to, whatever, whoever <laughs> produced these records had to be like, we need to cut some fat. Yeah. We're going a, a, yeah. a, an hour and 15 minutes of these records. What the fuck were they thinking? Like, no it's idea. just, it's like double weird. records. Really yeah. weird. Yeah. This was the time. And I, what's the next record we're talking about? Mudvayne LD50. All right. So Mudvayne LD50 is yeah. a, a cl one of the classics of new metal. Yeah. And I picked it. I picked this record because I never heard it in full before. I never listened to it front to back, but I've always enjoyed Death Blooms and Dig. And I was just like, fuck it. I'll listen to it. Let's do it. This record is so long. And this it's was so long. I didn't know. Bill, I had no to idea. To me, it doesn't feel that long because I love this album more than anything. It is really fucking good. Um, I will say that's that. That's why it was weird because I knew that I knew you liked this record. And I'm I'm glad. I always get glad when someone picks a record that another person on this show likes more. And then but it's the other guy picking. <laughs> the other guy's talking yeah. about it. Yeah. I, I mean, I picked this because, like, I'm, uh, truth be told, I'm running low on new metal things that I know. Like, I'm going to have to start going online and just looking up records Good that for I think you. are cool. Dude, do you that. You should and just, like, pick out ones that you've been interested in. That's what, that's what I'm doing now. It's like, all right, I've never heard LD50. It's the album. It's the Mudvayne album everybody talks about. And, like, you know, I was I, Mudvayne for me was a, what I like to classify in my own stupid head, is a LimeWire band for me. Back when I was like, I first downloaded LimeWire on my computer so I could start downloading music illegally. And getting a bunch of malware and, you know, on your computer. Yeah, exact. Fucking up my e-machines that yeah. I brought bought from Walmart. <laughs> my grandpa bought for me. Uh, yeah. I remember um, I had like a handful of Mudvayne songs. And I want to say the record that was out at the time when I had heard of them was Lost and Found was out. That was like the new one. So that's their third record. That's their third. Oh, and there's yeah. one in between it, and it's a long title. And that one the was end a of big, all things to come. That was yeah. a big record for them too. Well, what, in, what inspired me is I've been watching The Sopranos with Sam, my girlfriend, and uh, oh my god, should we just have an episode about The Sopranos, please? Yeah, hell yeah, <laughs> we should. I'm trying to watch good. all the. I'm trying to watch all the HBO classics. Like now, I'm watching Oz for the first. You like time. Sex in the City? Never seen it, but Amazing. that's on my list. Yeah, I'm gonna watch. I get shit on all the time. I get oh, shit yeah. on it for a lot of shit consistently, <laughs> sure. and that's one of them. Being Did a Sex in the City Oz? Oh yeah, and Oz is. Um, there was a fuck. There was another prison show. There was two. Uh, let me put it this way: No one knows about this show. I know uh, Eddie Lynn Paris knows about this because him and I used to talk about this show back in the day. If you're into Oz from back in the day, there was a one that came out five years ago. Short miniseries called The Night of. Oh, I've seen it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I never Amazing. checked it out. But on Netflix or on HBO. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. And it's a mini series, so it's yeah. so it's just you're in it for that season. It's and like you're done. ten episodes. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's really great. sick. Okay. It's great. It's yeah. really, John really Turturro's good. John Turturro's awesome in it. Yeah, it is good. Uh, there was Oz it, yeah. and then there was um The Wire, which were the two yeah, gritty. I haven't seen that either. The gritty HBO crime ish shows around that time. Yeah. Oz was the shit though, because it was for the most part takes place in a prison. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was sick. So anyway, <laughs> Good show. I was watching The Sopranos, yeah. and AJ ends up going to see, he convinces his mom, Carmela, to let him go see Mudvayne in New York City. Yep. And then he proceeds to go to like a hotel party with his buddies afterwards. He's lying and saying he's staying with Ed Meadows' apartment, and Meadows covering for him. Oh. And then he ends up shaving his eyebrows and like getting in all this trouble and shit, and then he shows up. That's when Tony and, spoilers, when Tony Whoa, and whoa, whoa, I haven't seen it <laughs> yeah. When Tony and Carmela are chance. divorced, they're separated. They're separated, yeah. yeah. So like uh um Tony comes back to like to the house where Carmela and him are staying at for some reason and AJ's walking down the stairs and he has no eyebrows and Tony can't figure out what's right. He's so like, what the fuck is different about what's you? What's different about you? Yeah. What's different about you? And the yeah. and the best is this, which was Tony, man, that show's so good. One, I've really contemplated. I don't want to do it because I don't want to say I'm doing it. I'm I'm about to say this on the show because people are gonna be like, when you done with that list, when you done with that yeah. list, I'm ranking. All of Tony's, besides Carmela's, besides Carmela, uh, his uh, girlfriends or Gumars, nice. as they say, Gumas. on the show, yeah. on the show from start to fucking finish. Who's I'm your number one? <laughs> if I were to say off the top of my head, I think maybe she'll get usurped by someone. It would be Gloria. Yeah, man, my number one too easily. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. 
She's the best. It was she's the also best crazy line. as fuck, too. Dude, the shit they did. Sorry, yeah, I, have cool. to, I have to say this, but like <laughs> the shit they did with her character in that show, I thought was genius, especially like Tony's dreams about her and stuff. Like I was me and my girlfriend got really baked and we watched the one episode. It's one of Tony's dream sequence episodes where like she's in it and she's dead and he's basically still in love with her and mm-hmm. he's wearing this black suit and they do this like really weird choreographed. It's almost like a dance, but it's like a kissing scene. And I was so high that I just started like sobbing. I was crying. I was just like, fuck, this is like intense. And my girlfriend was like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, this is so crazy. Like, because <laughs> Tony's just like, you love him, but he's a piece of shit at the same time. It's he's just a piece like, of shit with heart. Yeah, exactly. It's he, just crazy. He character. has so many. We, Gabe brought it up. There's the episode where. Um, oh, man, I wish I could be in on these conversations with you guys so he, bad. He. We can Tony, call Tony, <laughs> Tony kills Ralph over Ralph killing a horse. Mm-hmm. Guys, guys, boy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. Watch so, you guys. This show's ruining, over ten years old. No, no, it's show for it's way now. over ten years yeah, old. This, way yeah, so that, yeah. this this episode we just talked about premiered in two thousand. So you had your yeah. chance at two thousand twenty one. Yeah. I just got <laughs> HBO. All right, come on. Oh, you actually yeah. are you? You're Did serious? You get it? You just, you just, I do have HBO. Are you I have no desire to yeah, watch you Sopranos. Said you're, you said you're never going to watch it. He was, he was straight-faced about it. I'm like, oh, we just might have ruined the show yeah, for fuck. him. Uh, I, yeah. de- I definitely remember AJ loving New Metal and him wearing oh, yeah. New Fear Metal. Oh, Factory shirts. All, all the fucking That time. over poster that was in his room. Do you remember that? Yeah, and then also he was a big Slipknot fan. Yep. Yeah. Crazy and sick. Yeah, he had a Cold Chamber shirt, too. Oh, yeah. The show. I remember he that. He wears a hoodie when yeah. they're leaving... The, the soccer or the football team yeah, practice, and, right? Yeah, it's awesome. Tony convinces him to go get hot dogs. Yeah, okay. So just, sick, man. My dad's Italian, and I'm around the same age as AJ. Yeah. So there is, every time I see that relationship, I always think about my own <laughs> existence, yeah. which is awesome. It's funny, man. Oh, God, AJ's so funny. And then the the final thing about The Sopranos is in that episode where he comes back from the Mudvayne show, Yeah. Tony, since they're now divorced, they're Carmel and him don't necessarily have to be a team. They kind yeah. of like you know, take their own stance on things. And then Tony defends AJ. He's like, yeah. well, it's just boys being boys. Yeah, like they, they have were, drinks or whatever. That's <laughs> all it was. They were just drinking and fucking around. It's now, like, yeah, there is validity to what he said. Yeah. Which is, I agree. You can't like be like, you're, you're done. You're done forever. We, you know, that whole thing, blah, yeah. blah, blah. It's just, that's, that's what being a high school kid is. essentially. Yeah, exactly. You just don't want to get out of control. You yeah. Know? You know, and they're at a hotel. It could have been worse, you know? It could have been way worse. Yeah, so. But, yeah, I just thought it was so funny. And they were really touring Really good episode. On, they weren't touring on LD50. It was the end of All Things to Come, the uh, second that's... record. Because, like, they have posters of that album cover on the venue that AJ's leaving in New York. They're not in the show at all. No, they're not. Yeah. They don't play. But they mention Mudvayne. Their name is mentioned a couple times. And, like, it fits with his lineage, his new metal lineage. Because, like, all throughout the show, you see him, wear, you see him wearing, like, Fear Factory shirts, Cold Chamber shirts. What, like, uh, what's the story behind that? Is it like the actor himself? Like a he's huge a big, he was a big Rob fan. Rob Eiler. Rob Eiler was, he's our age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. Maybe he's a little older, but he might he was, be like a year or two. Older, he was a big fan. and He used he that as a platform to I didn't promote his favorite bands. Yeah. I didn't know that. There's That's pictures really cool. of him hanging out with like Slipknot. Oh, because if the Sopranos, which is one of the biggest shows of at the time. time yeah. And the Slipknot wasn't as big as the Sopranos at one point because sure. Slipknot was still coming out, making yeah. their way. So he, he's hanging out with them and he's <laughs> yeah. doing that whole thing. It's yeah. really cool. And then obviously what's really, really special about the Sopranos is like everyone, AJ matured and then he got out of wearing that new metal bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. But as a high school kid, he was all wrapped up in it. Yeah, I know. Really, it really was cool. so sick. Yeah. But anyway, so I was like, all right, fuck it. Let me listen to LD50. I know very little about this record other than the couple singles that I've heard and, um, it's really long, but I do like it a lot. I think there's a lot of cool ideas here. And it's also like, I feel like, I mean, this is a later release for a debut in new metal, if I'm correct, right? Because this came out in what? 2000. 90? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's definitely later on for a band to put out their debut. One, one, way, debut. one way to pinpoint it was, I think it came out in late 2000 because the whole um, thing behind the, the push. It was August. August 22nd, 2000. The whole thing behind this push was that the... One of the guys, I remember this record coming out. Like, I, I yeah. distinctly remember it dropping. They go, this band, Mudvayne, just came out with their record. They are from, they're not from Chicago. They're from not Peoria. From Peoria, or, yeah. Or only band ever gets signed out of Peoria, I bet. Yeah, I'm ever. sure. And they kept saying, the guy from Slipknot produced this. The guy from Slipknot produced yeah. this. And I go, which guy? I don't even, and they, go, they eventually started saying, the clown from Slipknot yeah, produced clown. this. So Slipknot had to get relatively big enough to get 
the leverage to be a producer on this record essentially yeah. because the cred was there and this record went ballistic yeah because people said we couldn't get enough of slipknot and then as soon as i saw the first video which was obviously the song we're going to talk about white background the co- these elaborate costumes and yeah. i remember distinctly saying to myself and believe me now i like it but i said oh no like <laughs> if, if, if every band is going to have a costume and shtick yeah. I have a desire to do music for the rest of my life, and I'm not, I don't want to wear a costume, even though, ironically enough, I kind of have my own little outfit on stage. <laughs> sure. I'm not wearing a costume. No, I'm you're painting not doing my face, face and shit, like, you know? Yeah. So I, just, I said, if if we're going this route with music, this is going to suck. Yeah. Well, they definitely look like they could have been coming from, like, the Dark Carnival, you know? Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. You know, they were kind of Juggalo-esque. It was, I remember Chad, the vocalist, he had... The blue hair, and he wore those weird overalls. Yeah, and he had like the silver face paint or whatever. Yeah, and very, yeah, very weird. long goatee. Yeah, First. nuts. Very weird look. Yeah, so like, this is like, I mean, from because I mean I've heard this so many times from every death metal dude imaginable who wants to just hate on new metal like, ever, like with every fiber of their being. Being usually nine times out of ten, the only record they admit to being yeah. sick is LD50 because it's like a tech record, you know. It's like so the tech. musicianship well, is like Ryan so and Matt cool. are easily probably like the undisputed champs of the rhythm section of like new metal. Dude, like for <laughs> real, that drummer down. is incredible. They are they're beasts. Yeah. They're, they're like so fucking good, and together they're yeah incredible. And it's funny because Greg, the guitar player, not exactly a great guitar player. He kind of plays. Just enough to stay out of their way to let them do their oh, thing, yeah. and it's awesome, dude. You you summed you it up know? perfectly. Actually, Chad kind of does the same thing vocally too. Yeah. Oh it's yeah, just, he's he's not a great vocalist, not at all. You know? No, yeah, I didn't think so. He's even worse live, unfortunately. Oh, I know. Like, one of the things I've hated on this band about forever is the fact that Chad, it, it's artistic. Don't get me wrong. We could use the example of their big song "Dig," which is he cuts and interjects vocals. So it's almost like there's three vocalists in the room and it's, it's he's the only yeah. guy. So it's like, fuck you, fuck you too. Blah, blah, blah. But he's yeah. not going. And I'm, then like, did it, like real fast cadences too. Yeah. And then it, it they go, go right over each other. They go right over yeah. each other. And that happens the whole record basically where it's just a punch fest. Yeah. And then I go, how could this guy do anything of the sort live? There's no, it's just Fun him. fact, he does it. <laughs> okay, he does it. If yeah, you watch some live videos, him. it's pretty it's a bummer because it's just like he's gassed like halfway through I'm sure. mainly because they were probably drugged out during most of yeah. that time when they're at their height and uh yeah he wrote vocal lines that were just like physically impossible yeah i mean some of the shit you on know. here it sounds like he's getting tired when he's singing it and i'm just like man you're really <laughs> fucking you know batting a hundred here yeah. <laughs> but it's like it's a cool record man like it, especially like some of these deep cuts on here and and this is it's, it's just funny because like i was baked when i was listening to this Good record to listen to, Baked, I'm assuming. I it is done it. good, and it's just funny because, like, the record sounds like the album art. Like, it sounds mm-hmm. like the way, like, the aesthetic fits it so perfectly. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a whole concept for sure. Yeah. Um, LD50, obviously, is the name of, I believe it's, isn't it the amount of dose you could give to a stock group of people where half of them will probably die from it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> talking about like, overdose. I think yeah. Mudvayne, though, from what I was. Pretty cool re- name. From what I was reading on Wikipedia, at least, it sounded like. They were kind of like kind of an experiment where it was like, all right, New Metal's giant. We're going to throw this band on here. Sean's going to like because Sean was an executive producer, clown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Apparently, the main producer was this dude, uh, Garth. Yeah. Some, or, yeah. So we've talked about him on the show. Good, good, Garth. Yeah. Good, good, Garth. So he this is I love that Garth did this record because this is shout out to Garth because he did. We've talked about him before. He did the first Kitty record. He did a bunch of L7 records back in the day. Or not a bunch. I think he only did one, actually. Did L7 record. He did the first Rage Against the Machine record. This was the first Rage Against the Machine record. Sounds amazing. I wouldn't say it's mainly based on Garth's production, though. I would say that the band is just whipped so fucking tight, and they yeah. have, they have a chemistry like no fucking other. Yeah, the bass Are, tone's really cool too. Um, but when it comes down to it, this is the best sounding Garth record he's ever done. Really? It mud this Mudvayne record. Damn. Okay. Has it's he done so- any other other records? Do you guys know? I don't think so. I just this debut because it's pretty different. Yeah. Like after this well, i was reading too that when they initially were coming out you know they they had like one ep before this like no, they had like they were, a full length that was yeah, like kill I released Auto. but that it was, was kill iota kill iota was an ep though from what i was reading oh it's an ep yeah kill iota was an ep and then they released it like af i want to say it was right after ld50 because right. that album blew the fuck up which i believe was not by their request either 
Yeah, I don't know. It was, label it was called the beginning kind of, like, of the, the beginning of all things to end. Right. Which was Kill Iota plus some other extra tracks, I believe. Which is not a great record. Like yeah, Kill Iota. I, I like, haven't heard there's it. There's some there's moments on there where you're like, Oh, this is cool. I can see why they yeah. became what they became. But, but the beginning of all, all things to all. end, which is the re release of Kill Iota with some like demo tracks, I believe. Mm-hmm. Which came out uh yeah, it's got live songs on it, and that came out in two thousand one. So it was kind of like in between uh, the end of all things to come and LD50 was something to put out, I believe. Because it was like, originally, I was reading that when they were first trying to market this band, they like were not into the costume idea. They were like, this is dumb. We're just going to put you out. Like, it's not going to be on the album cover. We're going to like just show your name out there, Mudvayne, your logo. That's it. But then, like, once this record started to take off and then the costume thing was inevitably accepted by them, they were just like, all right, fuck it. And I don't think they didn't do the costume thing for their whole career. I don't think they yeah. did it for the follow up album and they changed and then costumes. They stopped. Yeah. They, well, and, then they just started wearing like clothes, yeah, they right? They dudes, just looked like regular yeah. dudes. So I remember the second Gabe, one, they looked like aliens. Yeah, aliens. And Gabe, <laughs> Which is saw, cool. Gabe, saw, <laughs> Gabe saw them on that tour at House of Blues. I know that for a fact. I, really? I've seen them on that. Yeah. And then I saw them twice. And listen, man, maybe Mudvayne might have been a band that didn't really know how to do it live right from the jump and then had to kind of get their feet under them because they weren't probably a band for a long time. And I remember distinctly Chad between every song goes, everyone be like, yeah, cheering. And then you'd be like, all right, the song is called nothing to gain. Let's do this shit. Yeah. And then it would be, the song is called dig. Let's do this shit. It was always that. And that's not really how your stereotypical new metal dude that was versed with it would rile up the crowd between songs. You know, yeah. it was always, you know, what the fuck's up? <laughs> yeah. Or like Fred Durst talking about God knows what. Uh-huh. Or Corey Taylor, who became the end-all, be-all new metal front person of all yeah. time. And that includes John Davis, who's also phenomenal. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But uh, Corey probably takes the cake because Corey is just the man, you know? Yeah. They're all the man, actually. Even Fred Durst in, in his own way. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would I would agree with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. These are, yeah, these are timeless fucking front people. Yeah. yeah, say what you will, but like those guys command it like... They're iconic. Whole yeah. arenas of people at one point. You know, like it was yeah. amazing what they could do. Yeah. And then who's the guy that's come out? I like Randy Blythe a lot, obviously. Uh, I don't like M Shadows, but he's a big deal, right? From I think Avenged he was. Sevenfold. I don't know if he is so much anymore. <laughs> I mean, that band was huge. That band was yeah, monstrous. Yeah, they were big, yeah. But it's hard to get that that charismatic front man to the forefront anymore where they're yeah. just an ass beater. You know, where, yeah. you know. Started with guys like Headfield and Mustaine, and then it goes to Anselmo's and these this crop. There's so many of them. Even Des Full Chamber. I mean, that guy's yeah. still fucking amazing. You know, <laughs> yeah. Bird C. Bell. Like these are these guys are the shit. Yeah, and yeah. and they all had their own s- style. True. You know. Yeah. And then the sucky ones when you sucked, unfortunately, you it, it's like you got ran over, man, because it's like if you sucked and you got had to. Uh, fucking open up and then guys like Surge from System or Burton C. Bell followed your ass, you get mm-hmm. destroyed. Those guys had so much charisma. Sure. You know, and they were just doing their, they were being themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and I was I was reading that, well, because like the Mudvayne guys, or at least some of them, ended up doing hell yeah, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah, that was Greg the thing. And Chad. Greg yeah, and Chad. Ugh, that sucks. It's you know? so weird going from <laughs> Mudvayne to this to yeah, hell yeah. it doesn't yeah. make any sense. And, I can see it because the last Mudvayne record has like those tinges of that weird country vibe that they really? they're going for in hell the last the self-titled Mudvayne yeah. record interesting it's, yeah that's why I was like that was a huge disappointment of an album the one that me. came out in 2009 yeah yeah it has like a twanginess to it yeah, interesting yeah I've never heard it I've never heard any Mudvayne record all the way through but this record was really good this band needs to get back I mean, together so it's, I was if reading they, that there's, did, there's it talks amazing, of it. It's needed, but I, was, I can't imagine it's going to happen. I, was I don't that, understand why. There's talks believe, about it. There's like, some rumors going on. That hell yeah, do but I believe like Greg and Chad, I don't think, get along. Listen. Um, but once again, Greg, not a great guitar player. They could get anybody. Do you hear my joke? Oh, you didn't hear it, Jason. <laughs> this joke, I occasionally write jokes. Okay. And uh, I wrote a joke the other day that apparently, I think it made Bill laugh. No, it didn't, but go on. <laughs> do you ever wish a motherfucker was dead? Until he dies, and you're like, man, I wish that guy was still alive. <laughs> like it's, it's not, which is like, Chad might hate fucking what's his nuts. Greg, yeah. But as soon as he dies, he'll be on Twitter. My brother, I lost a oh, brother yeah, yesterday. Lost still brother Anselmo and dying, dude. No, but and I don't that, think they that, hate each other. They didn't. I, well, I don't know. Like that's a oh, that's a pretty good example. But yeah. these guys are not. They're not Chad and and uh, what's his name? Who Greg. don't get Greg. Yeah, no. I believe I'm not sure because I know like, there's something there's two people who don't get along and kicked the, him out of the band. But this Mudvayne incident has had years to work itself out. Yeah, and it's surprising it has already. 
And it sucks for Mudvayne because they were my friend Raz who hated it. He went to go see um Hell Yeah at fucking that club out in fuck oh, it's called Home Bar in Palatine or whatever the fuck. Oh yeah. Oh, in Arlington Heights? I, I think. I think it's yeah. Arlington Heights Palatine yeah, yeah, yeah. border yeah. or whatever. Hell yeah, played there? Yes. And he goes, and I said, was any I say this sarcastically to some people. Was anybody there? I go, was anyone even there? And it's like a weeknight, and he goes, it was fucking beyond packed. I'm sure it had to be. That's and a small well. venue for a band like that, I feel like. And I go, wow, no, hell yeah. It's a pretty big venue. Home Bar? Is it? I've I never think been. I'm thinking of something else. No, he, no it was it at Dirty Home Bar. Sure. No, he was at, no, he was at Home Bar. It uh, could be true. And then Maybe, what happened, like, we saw, him and I saw Super Joint at Home Bar before. And oh. it was, he goes, yeah, I went, I went, I had been here for Mud, or uh, hell yeah, recently. But they were there, and. He goes, I hated it. He goes, it was such a douche fest. Hell yeah, sucks. And then it sucks because you never want to see a, a dude's band taken away from him. But Vinny Paul was in hell yeah, and he's dead, yeah. and they haven't played since. I don't think they're going to do anything. I don't think they're going to yeah. do I think there's So it would be the perfect time for Monday. I think a, to... I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, though, and I thought about this. I am not a hell yeah fan by any means, but I know the perfect guy to replace Vinny Paul if they were to do it. Ooh. You don't even know him. Remember Jason Bittner? Yeah. yeah, from Shadows, Shadows Fall. Fall. Yeah, yeah, he's the perfect guy. We used yeah. to see him every week at the music garage. <laughs> oh, no. oh, really? Yeah, yeah he, he was like there all the always time. doing clinics. Yeah, at yeah. Vic's. Yeah. I think he was good friends with All right, Vic. so yeah. I, I'm sorry I acted like you guys didn't know him. Oh, dude, but, Jason Bittner like, and Charlie Benante, that guy, dude. Like, behind stage, just fucking shredded up for Shadows Fall. I, that I dude rules. He, yeah. Like, he's so good. He is, and I think he's a perfect guy that's a Vinnie Paul carbon copy if he oh, wants yeah. to be. Like, he, that was one of his favorite drummers you could tell growing up, I think. Definitely. Oh, yeah, big time. He wasn't raised on... Some guys were raised on the Lombardo tip yeah. or X drum or whatever. Some guys are influenced mainly by Bill Ward, and you tell they're, they're, oh, yeah. they're lazy drummers that don't tune their drums well <laughs> and shit. But when it comes down to it, you could tell Bittner fucking loved Vinnie Paul and yeah. just wants to rock. Yeah, absolutely. So it would make sense. And Jason I Bittner seen... was like one of those drum like icons for a while because he was like him and Charlie from Anthrax would do like they would do clinic tours all the time. Like me and my dad would always talk about going to see like Oh, let's go see Charlie Benante and Jason Bittner. We never did, but they would always be at like the Guitar Center in Arlington Heights or some shit like that. Like, I know at least I know once Bit a year. I don't know if Bittner lived here. Does well, he I live here? I don't think he does. I don't think he lives okay, here. Okay, I thought, but he was just here because Benante. Yeah, he, he Benante is here. Yeah, like he I know lives. That. He lives out mm -hmm. in the burbs somewhere. Uh, I love. That's one band that I want to maybe try to crowbar in talking about sometime. Is, is Anthrax? No, Shadows Fall. Oh, okay. Because we can't metal really core, do it. Though, it's, yeah. yeah, it's too metalcore. There's so many bands that like I fucking love with the first wave of them, whether it be First Lamb of God or I've been listening to Some Shadows Fall lately. That band was actually pretty fucking sick. Yeah, they did. They got overshadowed by Hill Switch and Lamb of God crushing them because they wrote better songs. Big time. But they were around that God Forbid tip. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. The second, that era, the second yeah. meaty piece of great. All that remains. Yep. Yeah. All that remains is still pretty huge because yeah, they have that true. whole um, USA following where it's <laughs> yeah. dudes with like you know the uh, the burning flag uh, like uh, uh, tap out it, shirts yeah tap yeah. Out, <laughs> tap out with the burning flag like uh, not a not a burning Church flag a, a tattered skulls. flag yeah, like it's, there we go. this flag's been <laughs> yeah. through hell but these colors don't run. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's so funny yeah so yeah this this Mudvayne album is nuts it's too long I will agree by the second half of it I was just like oh my god I don't know if I could do this anymore it was really hard to hang in there and it was like it's it's hard to listen to an album like this front to back because it's so dense and not only are these like is this a long album but there's just a lot of songs on it there's like 16 songs I want to say on this or 17 a lot yeah, it was a lot, and as sometimes, well as, like, like 17 stuff, songs. Right? Yeah, there's, like, three interludes, um, or four of them, and, or, I don't know. There's a lot of them, there's but still, it's, like, some of these songs are fucking long, man. Like, it's just, like, do I really need to hear a six-and-a-half-minute song? Like, and yes. sometimes I've been noticing that they'll, like, it's almost like, I, I wish I, like, took better notes, but some of these songs feel like they're songs within the songs. Like, I was listening to a song, it was either severed or prod or Prod's kind of a cool name for a song or cradle <laughs> cradle is like one of my favorite songs yeah ever. and it was just like that's a long one. like they would do a chorus and then it's like they go into this whole other song and then they end it by bringing it back to that chorus. And i'm like whoa i forgot i'm listening to this song still <laughs> like it, it's just really disorienting but it's good man like i really like the song internal primates forever that's my that's favorite song yeah, on the record that's now, a really good one i got as soon as you brought up LD50 and we uh -huh. said they're doing it, I got nervous because <laughs> this was a record that I could listen to a lot, and I, I did. Uh, 
back in the day. And I could listen to it so many times and still get lost in the songs, meaning I don't know, I have no clue what's going on. Sure. And Internal Primates is a great example of that. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a song I love. That yeah, riff, awesome. that intro riff is just like, you're a badass fucking new metal riff from hell. Yeah. Da, 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 da. And it's like, you know, fucking yeah. cuts into it. And then there's one funny thing about that, which is he starts saying, jump! Yeah. Jump! But it sounds almost like he's saying Jeff. Yeah. Jeff! <laughs> Jeff! Yeah, sick dude. <laughs> yeah. Now, what I up, love Jeff? that song. Yeah. I can't tell. I couldn't learn that song to play and uh, sing it and anything if you give me a year. Yeah. It's so it's all over the place. It's like and it yeah, reminds it's me weird. Of, it reminds me of if a band like maybe Dysrhythmia did yeah. attack attempt doing something traditionally new metal. Yeah. Which is actually pretty fucking cool. Yeah. But these songs are all over the place at times. And then yeah. ironically enough, the ones that are the bigger songs are the ones that aren't fucking all over the place. Yeah. Dig was the big song. Nothing game was a big song. Yeah. Death Blooms. Death Blooms, yeah. yeah. And those were like the three big ones of the record, and those were enough, yeah. because all it was trying to do was this is this is this record's very good, all right. But I'll tell you about the length and how it comes into play, and how the length hurts this record when some records around the same time had a similar length. Toxicity for Slipknot record, and you don't get lost in in that those records no. and say I can't do this whole thing. You're yeah. saying these are all bangers. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's this is why the Mudvayne record's a pretty damn good record, and those other ones are timeless. Yep. Because you don't get... We, you brought up... Last time we did this shit, you brought up how you love the song Forest by System. Oh, and I yeah. said I hate that yeah. song, but we both knew it. Yeah, yeah, we did both know it. That is very true. Yeah, man, I do love Forest. That is a great song. <laughs> and I hate it still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we both know it. Yeah, it's pretty wild, man. It's just it's it's Funny, really I have dense. none of those grievances with this album. <laughs> you, think, yeah. you don't think it's too long? Well, I'm sure. It's I love sick. it front to back. I've I don't even know how many times I've listened to this album. It's still in my car. Hell I yeah. still listen to it on CD in my car. Yeah, That's CDs. Awesome. When you um, have those CDs in your car and you just put pop in, a yeah. CD is still amazing to listen to anything then, on. Yeah. Don't care. No matter where it starts, I don't care. I'll just keep that album nah, loop. Just it doesn't it, matter. Yeah, because yeah, I love this album more than anything. It, That's it's awesome. So good. And uh, it's funny, yeah. I found Mudvayne because I saw him open for Slipknot at Congress Theater. Yes, with and dope being uh, direct support. I did not. I wasn't at that show, but I did see Slipknot three times at Congress Theater, but not I'm the sure. Mudvayne show. What um, what album was Slipknot touring on? That was the first one, first right? One. Yep. Oh wow! But that tour now to put it in perspective, though, that tour for the first Slipknot record lasted like five years, I think, or like oh. it, it was it wasn't five years. It wasn't five years. It was oh, actually only about three years, but it was. It they, felt like five. <laughs> it felt like five, but they never, they toured non. They toured non. Non. They never came off the road. They like didn't have homes. Yeah. Wow. And then they went. They became essentially the biggest band in metal and went right into the studio and recorded Iowa, yeah. which is arguably better. They yeah. were on a streak like no other. They didn't come off the fucking road. Mm -hmm. It was just that, and they That's just got nice. bigger and bigger and bigger and fucking bigger. The first time Slipknot I think played Chicago on a uh, mainstream tour mm -hmm. was. I was not at it, but it was them opening up for Machine Head and Cold Chamber at the Metro. And oh, Amen, wow. Amen was the... Uh, so Slipknot opened the show. Oh, wow. Now, that was... it. Might have been, We might have talked about this here, but it was during this era of Cold Chamber, cool chamber music or whatever. And what is interesting is it was perfect for a, putting a band like Slipknot on the road because you could have this whole back line go up and there's no... It, they had to open up the show because they could yeah. only open up a show or headline a show because <laughs> all the crap was, on yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah. all this shit. You can't be a mid band slipknot th deal because it would take forever to fucking bust the shit on and off. Yeah. You know, it's got to be, you got to close the show or open a show because you have to have that learning. You know, <laughs> no, seriously, right? Yeah. Can't the production have that is so 15 big. minute uh, changeover. That's the key. It's not going to work yeah. out. And then, ironically enough, before you knew it, slipknot was a headliner like that. Yeah. Yeah. They outlived all those bands too, most of them. Oh, yeah. If not all of them. Slipknot has big news planned apparently this week too. Yeah, I read Corey Taylor said something about that. I think that. that Slipknot is announcing a tour. I think that they are going to announce a tour for the fall in the United States and try to make it fucking work. Really? And it's going to be maybe the late fall, but they're going to get tickets rolling. And then I think that people, the way I'm seeing it going, there will be shows going on in late fall. Cool. That'd be awesome. It's still a long time from now. Yeah. It's almost nine months from now. So. Yeah. But they want to get tickets fucking going. Yeah. And then they're going to be on the forefront of what would be the first wave of saying it's okay to go out and see live music again, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, that's wild, man. But yeah, this, this Mudvayne record, it's just, uh, I can imagine, like, 
if you're a Mudvayne fan, like if I loved Mudvayne and like this is awesome to have as a first record because there's so many songs on it. There's so much music. So it's sick because it's like if you're a fan, you're getting a shitload of content Best that bang you like. For your buck. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's great. And that's that's really why, like sick. I said, for me, I love this album. I'm sure. And it is sick. <laughs> and I understand like, the grievances with it. Be, you know, of course, that, being yeah. long. And if I like if I was a Mudvayne fan, I would love that too because it's like, well, oh, like just any more Mudvayne. Yeah, you love like exactly you know, a long but, album, a lot of songs. When you love something. You want more of it, yeah. man. And I just watched, talked to Bill about it. I watched that, rewatched that movie called The Re- Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, hell yeah. It's three hours long. Yeah. And I, it takes me, I'm a guy that, it, this is my, another joke I wrote. It takes me two hours to watch 60 minutes. Yeah. Because I, when I see a movie I like, I pause it, I rewind it, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Doing that with a three hour Revenant and the movie's slow moving as hell. Yeah. I can't get a fuck enough of it. Yeah. I'm just like, I rewind movie, it. It's man. so good. Yeah. Rewind it. And it is slow at times. It's him just, cascading through you know <laughs> yeah. a winterous environment yeah, tundra. yeah tundra, Dude, essentially. I, I actually bought the soundtrack to that movie i love oh, it so much cool. yeah it's really yeah good. and it is a really great soundtrack yeah yeah, yeah i need to watch that music's movie really again. pretty yeah like, I, I saw it in theaters and me too it was awesome so good oh i, I saw it seen i saw film. it in theaters too and that director uh alejandro iranutu mm-hmm. is a fucking master he's such a great director yeah and movie's phenomenal if you haven't checked it out check out the fucking the revenant. revenant yeah but that's an example of when you're into something, even if it's long, short, well, you can't get fucking enough of it. Stop it. Let's keep listening to it. Give me more of it, man. This give me B sides, <laughs> right. whatever you got, man. Yeah. This is scene Shit. footage, yeah. any of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is cool. So it's like I respect that that they did that. And for the, it's it's interesting because like there's a lot of, you know, when I'm reading about the history of this record, there was a lot of mentioning about like, oh, okay, you know, uh they were really cut on time for this record, where it was just kind of like they went to like Canada, I guess. Yeah, to record I was in Canada. It. Yeah. yeah, and like they were saying that they, they didn't have any Garth, time. Garth, I think, out. is from Canada. Yeah. yeah. So they didn't have any time. Garth was like really strict with them on this record. He was like, "All right, you're working and working and working like long days." Like he probably maybe they pulled in a favor to use Garth. Maybe. Yeah. Like I don't you know, know you know when you know this is like a funny thing, especially with like music and shit like that. When favors get pulled in, they're like, "All right, I'm gonna do this, but you like you better fucking come to play. Yeah. Like I have no time for this bullshit." One of those things. Like, go, go, go. Yeah. As opposed to if it's like a mainstream band going to them. Yeah, let's take some time, you know, do your thing, you know. But it worked out for Mudvayne, obviously. Yeah, it did. But it's it's weird because it's like, man, if you guys were cut on time, why did you make seventeen songs? And like, why is your record and they all sound songs they all sound good too? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But apparently, some of this shit was written in the st- like some of the lyrics were written in the studio because they weren't that prepared and like, uh, like nothing to gain was recorded in the studio or was written in the studio. That's a but great that's, song. Yeah, it's one of the best songs on the album, I think. It is. I love that song. That's a really that's a hard as fuck song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's that's cool. Really, too. a great song, and then obviously, Gain is spelled like Ed Ed, Ed Gein. Gein. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's all about him. That's all yeah. about. Oh, really? Yeah, it's okay. about Ed Gein. Like they were looking, reading like through true crime books and shit to get inspiration. <laughs> get apparently, yeah. I wish it wasn't <laughs> yeah. written about Ed Gein. I wish it was just about him being a badass or whatever. Yeah, because that song is hard as fuck. Yeah, it is hard as fuck. I it's, love that tune. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's just it was it's a cool record. It's a cool like. I think Mudvayne is a cool band. And like, I never understood it because when I had listened, like I said, when I discovered them, that third record was out with that song. You remember the song happy? Mm -hmm. That was like one of the first Mudvayne songs I ever heard. And I thought it was more of like an alternative rock sound song. Like it doesn't sound anything like, like it sounds like an almost completely different band. So I was just like, what the fuck happened? How did they go from like, Bum, bum, bing, bum, right. bing, to like this weird, like, <laughs> like rock, almost Nickelback sounding type song. It didn't make any sense to me. So, I don't know, and I still, t- I mean, there will be one day where I'm, I mean, I already want to listen to this second Mudvayne record a lot, like, because I know the singles on it are good, um, like Not Falling. and Not, fa- uh, Not Falling was huge. Yeah. And then Not Falling is a great example. This was the first band that properly used double bass in new metal. Oh, yeah. My version, like, when I hear Slipknot, then they kind of jumped on that bandwagon, but it was just a bombardment oh, yeah. of rolly drums, so you couldn't even tell if it was yeah. double bass or a tim timpani or whatever the fuck that shit's called but this is motherfucker crushing the double bass and then not falling was bam but a but a bump bam or no yeah something like there's like some cool and then obviously in dig there's that but a but a but a but yeah 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 it's so sick but yeah i mean it was it's just yeah that's that's not falling i think no that's dig they're very similar. Yeah, it is very yeah. similar. I thought that too. I was like, not man, falling. is this just yeah? The chorus is not just falling different. is an awesome song. Yeah, it is a good song. <laughs> Dig's great too, man. 
the most memed out fucking song though. I've seen so many memes about. Yeah, that I song. don't understand why that happened. I don't like, know. All either. of a sudden, that was like everywhere. And I was like, okay, I guess it's a cool I'll take song it. and it's aggro. I like going on YouTube because you could watch uh, uh, for the music video. They have the individual cuts of every member. Yeah, that so was on cool. the DVD that I own. But go on. Oh, was it on the DVD <laughs> oh. for the music video? Yeah, yeah it is. Okay, yeah, is the they DVD... just ripped it from there. What is the DVD? Is it's it like... just the music video behind the scenes? You can find it all on YouTube. It's all and really? every there's angle. A, there's a whole documentary member. made, two hour documentary HBO style about just the about music the video. <laughs> Dude, the only and all the trials and tribulations that happened, the, and there, the, there was a the, death on the on the set. The bugles they, being painted. They found yeah. the person who died in the uh, water tank of the of the uh, studio. And <laughs> yeah, Dude, the only other band I know that's released all in dig. I'm sure there's probably a lot that have done this, but like remember, Tool put out DVDs of uh, Parabola and Schism. Do you remember that? Like they were just single DVD releases of just the music videos, oh, so you could okay. own yeah. copies of like the music videos, which yeah, I thought was cool. I remember, yeah, but I was just like, why would you do that? Like, Schism, it's Schism so is uh, there was a time when the pieces yeah. fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one of the things I don't like about Mudvayne too is they're they're obviously monstrous Tool fans. Oh, big time! And it is ever present. Do you not like Tool? No. Okay. Uh, I will. I don't fuck with anyone who does like Tool. I because if there's I a lot of bands, I don't, like you know, some bands, some motherfuckers I will fuck with if they like the wrong band. Yeah, uh, me, not, I like so just so on the same page. But I like a lot of bands from that uh, early Real '90s era that everyone's like, "You like that band?" I'm like, "Hell yeah, I like that band a lot." So as long as you don't fuck with me, I'm not fucking with your Tool, dude. I don't. I'm not a. I like Tool in passing. I'm not a Tool aficionado. I'm not a Tool not a time tool user. Fan. You know? Yeah, I'm not like I like Tool, but I don't like. I could give a fuck if somebody. It's, they're like one that. of those it's bands like, if right. it's on at a party all right yeah i'm not gonna check it out like you know <laughs> and then also when was the last time any of us were at a party six years ago <laughs> probably <laughs> probably at this yeah. house actually yeah, yeah. Days further. um yeah probably <laughs> so funny but here's the thing with um when you get to the late the the meat and potatoes of the middle tracks on this record there's a song negative one i think mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah then you start seeing the tool come the mainer come out of Chad, oh, big time! Yeah, where it said, ah, yeah, like Death Blooms, the verse on Death Blooms, where he's singing like, <laughs> that's yeah, ex- yeah. very Maynard worship. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so you could tell they're huge fans of it. But I mean, these guys after after this record came out became household names, and then yeah, yeah, kind of made good on it. And I'm just glad that it's so weird, man. Again, the this band needs to get back together. I think that Slipknot for a minute was trying to get them back together, do like a tour with Slipknot, really, because. If Sli- that would be massive. It would be massive. Yeah. <laughs> if Slipknot comes knocking on your door, it's like Metallica knocking on your door. If yeah. Metallica came knocking on my door and says, "Get your high school band back together," I'd be like, "Yep, we're practicing tomorrow." Yeah. <laughs> you make, there's yeah. some people you can't say no to. And then I brought this up before. Um, one of the gu- the guys in Skid Row were getting approached not for not to tour with Metallica. That's the difference. But Metallica was saying, "Hey, you guys got to get back together." Like the original lineup, and some of the members were like. If Metallica says we should get back together, we should. Yeah. Because they are the end all be all time controllers of rock music, basically. Oh, yeah. So it's not some, it's not your dad saying, you might want to try that. <laughs> yeah. Know, try whatever. me a minute. So it's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. You guys did that. Yeah. You should do it again. <laughs> yeah. You got, I remember you having a lot of fun during that time. <laughs> yeah. It's just Metallica being like, oh, do a band again. Yeah. yeah. I would do it. And isn't it weird that the singer of Dragon Force, the old singer of Dragon Force, is now the singer of fucking Skid Row? Row. Yeah. That's, that's a, a downgrade really? for him because yeah. Dragon. Dragon Force was going to be the next big thing for a minute. Yeah, they, they were they huge. Are on fire for right. a minute, and then he left, and then you never heard about him anymore. You always would hear that uh, when Guitar uh, Hero on thing blew up, the fire through fire the fire and flames, flames was always yeah. the hardest song. Hell yeah, because it's Herman Lee or whatever. Yeah, I think his name's Herman. Dude, Lee. Adrian used to be able to beat that on like the expert mode. Really, he was really good. Yeah, Holy I used shit. to watch him do it, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah he was really fucking good. He was how like, to do that on Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Adrian, know if he still got Adrian his has a Twitch. No, he's got he, YouTube. He, he has a YouTube to. channel, but yeah, he used to do Twitch a while ago. It cool. wasn't big or anything. I've been I've been wanting to see uh or Adrian for a minute, so maybe I'll go on his YouTube channel and see. Dude, check, oh, it check it out, out. man. Yeah, I I some vegetables. Was, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And it's it's about food, right? Yep. yep. It's all about cooking, cooking vegetables. vegetables. Yeah, it's great. I've already lost interest with vet when you you lost me at vegetables, <laughs> but I want to see Adrian. Though. I hear you, man. One of his videos is gaining a lot of traction recently. I don't know if yeah, saw. he's been doing. I was talking to him about it today. He's been doing those YouTube shorts, yeah, which the is like minis. where they're like 
their comp- competition with TikTok, and he's saying like it's such a brand new thing to YouTube that there's barely no competition. So he's like crushing Ooh, it. Nice. He's got like thirty nine thousand views on a video right now. That's or awesome. Like that he Good for him. Like, Wait, yeah. what? That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. All right, so that's traction as fuck. Yeah, he's getting big, so it's pretty cool. Fuck yeah, pretty sick guys. <laughs> so shall we uh, move on to the last record here? Yeah, sure. You American Hizzy. About- I love that. I do. <laughs> this record is great. And there's uh, there's one thing I do hate about this as well, which sure. is it's about we we're maybe going to talk about Dig for a second. Uh, when you listen to the album version of Dig, they have the fucking every new metal record started out with a random ass sound clip noise bullshit as, yeah. a, as track one. Uh, and the sound clip drifts into the beginning of Dig on the record. Yeah. And I've always hated it because yeah, in, the really? mu- in the music video, it doesn't do that. It no. starts off, bam, 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 yep. bam, bam. That's the, what I wanted to hear from. And you, it, you'll you always get that lame version on listening to the record, which is when you're going to hear it most because you're not going to be watching a YouTube video at all times, you know? Mm. So I always piss me off. It was a dumb move. Yeah. Very dumb move. I hear you. Never bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, shit, man. Maybe one day we'll see some LD50 being reprised. That'd be awesome. Yeah. The drummer, yeah, I forget his name, but he rocked Matt um, McDonough. Matt McDonough. Yeah. He used to rock uh, fucking, he was the first guy I ever saw. Actually, no, it was him and Danny Carey, like simultaneously rocked Axis pedals. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, that's funny. Yeah. So in the if you watch the uh, big video, he's, it's, playing he's Axis destroying pedals? Axis pedals. And I believe he is, um, you know, the move, I, drummers will know what this maybe term is or whatever, but he plays double bass with, with lifting his feet. Yeah, heel up. Heel. He's playing heel low. So he's going. Yeah. So he's like. And then there's the other side where you're just going. You're rocking your feet back and forth. No one can see my feet right Wibble. now. Yeah. yeah. So he played heel up. Yeah. Very sick. Yeah. Yeah. He. I. It, I don't know how easy it is to find, but at one point, post mode vein, he did a band that was like a death metal band. Really? Yeah. You like a technical death metal band. I can't remember. Hmm. It's, I remember hearing the recordings, and they're not that great sounding, but the drumming is awesome. <laughs> Interesting. That's very... Is he playing, like, Blast? Yeah, dude. It's, like, all heavy as shit. It's awesome. He was born in Rockford, Illinois. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think he also did a project with his brother, which was... Audio like Topsy. Electronic. Yeah. And then Greg started, Topsy with Audio Ha Greg started a new band that was, like, not good. Just, like, a really bad alt-rock band. I don't know. There's a music video with that. I don't know what I forgot what it's called, but it's not that good. Yeah. And then Ryan Martini has a new band that's kind of like a jazz rock type band, like instrumental. And it's just him <sighs> writing. So if you Sick. like his bass playing, like a lot of people do, just listen to that. Is it cool? Yeah, it's fun. Hell Name yeah. one new metal band though that sh- that would be more popular getting back together than them. <sighs> no one, right? Yeah, I can't think of any. That would be one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Back. I mean, like, I don't I don't know who we lost that is just not doing it anymore. I mean, Cold Chamber did and then they came back. And that was cool. And yeah. then but Mudvayne would be bigger. I think, than, oh, yeah. I think so. But too. I when Cold Chamber came back, it was amazing. I loved yeah. it. I was at the gig. It was so it was fucking great. Because yeah, the other side of it too is a lot of people like we know they're in like the metal scene. Like so many of them will go back and say, like, well, yeah, Matt McDonough and Ryan Martini are like my biggest influence oh, on yeah. why I'm a technical player. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so if those dudes were to like come back. Oh, you get that whole scene. Oh going yeah, back dude. To it, you know, them and Necrophage is co-headliner. <laughs> Just kidding. Mudvayne would like oversell the fuck out of them. I would think so. Yeah. Necrophages yeah, honest, would still yeah. draw. That'd be a great tour. It would be a yeah. great they, tour. Yeah. Necrophages that they played would probably draw five hundred people in Chicago. Yeah, I'd go. House of Blues, probably, or not. Not House. We of Blues, would all not be house, there. It would be like, oh, there would be like bottom yeah. lounge. Yeah. Yeah. Nuts. Crazy. I like. I'm a big not a necrophagia fan at all. I'm a big necrophagia fan, which I, no one ever necrophagia? listened. Necrophagia. Yeah, I know them. Woo! <laughs> that band is the shit. Everyone listened to necrophagia immediately with the Slayer record. I told them about yeah. <laughs> necrophagia. The, the vocalist, you know, the vocalist Killjoy. Yeah. No, no, his name is Killjoy. Oh, his name is Killjoy. Yeah, and uh, when it comes down to it, he just died recently. Yeah. He is oh, the si- one of the sickest, and his band's not even death metal. It's more like death groove metal. Yeah. But he has one of the most sick vocals perform like dudes ever. And they were a band that came out. They came out pre Cannibal Corpse. They had nothing oh, to do yeah. with Cannibal Corpse, but their first record, which is called Season of the Dead, I believe, mm-hmm. came out like months before the first Cannibal Corpse record dropped. And what happened was they broke up. It was like essentially one of the first death metal records of all time. And they broke up for twenty years, and then got back together. <laughs> Necrophagia? Started, yes. Yeah. And it started doing shit. 
But uh, that band is so killer. Hell yeah. Way better than Necrophagia. You think so? <laughs> yeah. Necrophagia? Yeah, absolutely. Do you not like Necro? You don't like Necrophagia? No, it was just too... That's too Guitari? Re- um, too Guitari, too... Oh, I never got into anything all over the place musician. Sure. You like, like Disentomb, though, right? Yeah, Disentomb's the shit. I think that they have more slam than a thing like Necrophagia oh, yeah. does have. And Necrophagia's just off the wall. Like, when, yeah. uh, what's that one band that came back? Bloodbath or whatever? Or, um, not Bloodbath. Um, I don't know. Uh, Were they a tech band? No, it's, I, whatever. It might have been Bloodbath. But when it came, comes down to it, any anything that's like the technical side of death metal, mm-hmm. I was like out. I, oh, okay. I can't do it. I like the ignorant death metal sure. more than anything. Or this, it's still techy enough for me. Yeah. You know, it's just hard playing. It's shreddy and you got to know how to fucking shred yeah, and do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And your dynamics, if you're a drummer, particularly need to be tight. Oh, yeah. And also, I worship any true school death metal bassist that does. Yeah, finger. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, I know how to fit. If, you, if you're going to be death metal bassist, Dude, do it Alex how they Webster, did it. Yeah, dude. do it like that. Yeah. There was a band, a sick ass band, called uh, um, Amongst the Swarm from Indianapolis. Okay. And they did Cannibal Corpse states when on the on the Vile tour back in the day. Really. And homeboy told me way back in the day when I met those dudes, he goes, like Alex Webster taught me how to do like this, and he goes, I learned so many fucking strategies with how to play with my fingers and how to get this finger involved and uh. everything. And he goes, this is the way to play death metal bass. Wow. And I go, you're, you're Amongst right. Amongst the Swarm. Yeah, they're, they're probably the sh- not a band anymore. Not, no, they were a band that. Never heard of them. They, yeah. Uh, they were, again, they did what would be, they were probably a regional band in the Midwest. Yeah. And did, like, what would be the vile run, the sure. regional aspect of that. They did, like, probably six or seven dates with them. But that's, that's the career defining. You're with Cannibal Corpse, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But that band was the shit. And they were. Kind of like a dying fetus meets, but a little more techy, and a a smidge smidge influence of what would be early um first wave hardcore type deal or, or core, you know, it's like yeah. death core or whatever that whole thing. Kind of like what Black Dolly ended up doing or whatever. Sure. Great band, everyone should check them out. They're awesome. Black Dolly Murder? No, um, <laughs> amongst, amongst the swarm. swarm. Yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. Well, sweet. Well. All right, on Shall the next we, uh, one. charge our heads with some <laughs> yeah. American head charge? So this comes compliments of Zach from the Five Iron Club, cool. the co-host with Brian Watts oh, okay. from Steve's. Uh, he messaged us about, like, he goes, man, you guys should, like, look at this album, which was funny because, one, uh, this was an album I never got into when it came out. I saw the band live a few times, and I always liked them, and then, like, the singles I always heard, I always liked them. Sure. Never really delved into like listening to the album for whatever reason. I don't know why. Oh, so was this new to you the first time you heard? Not really. I had listened to it in the past, and I was like, all right, whatever, and just kind of shelved it. And then more recently, listened to it just for their shits and giggles, and I was like, fuck, I love this album a lot. (laughs) And then Zach just very serendipitous messaged us and was like, you guys should do that. And I was like, it's not a bad idea. Like it'd be fun to talk about. Nice. It wasn't gonna be one of my first picks for this show. But because he brought it up, and I was like, well, I actually listened to it and really liked it re- more recently. I was like, ah, oh, fuck it. Let's do it now yeah. now more than ever. And plus, I love those dudes, so we'll do it for them. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 it's I, a great I really, really like this album a lot. Yeah. I think it's a great new metal album. Um, it is long, but once again, I have no issues with it. I, I sure. like all these songs. Like, it was weird, because I remember even in the back end, there were songs that I heard that I was like, oh, I really like these songs a lot. And I was like, then this is the back end of the album, which was kind of weird. <laughs> so having to get there, it wasn't an issue. I was just like, sure. oh, yeah. Every song has a great... I, the writing on this album is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah I there's think a lot it's of so aggression good. to this album. It's well, very wait, so, heavy. Yeah. so you just recently re-listened to this record, and now... In the last, like, year, like, really, like, listened to it. And you really dig it. Yeah, a lot. I think it's a great written album i know and this this record is pretty awesome and i I did see this band and listen to this record back in the day and saw them a couple times on this tour or uh, on i'm which would be once on this on this album it was the slipknot tour right no it was at house of blues and i think it was mudvayne i Uh, saw them i saw them as well at house of blues opening for someone yeah times were them opening and one one was slipknot and one was at house of blues slipknot was at they it was pledge of allegiance i think they were they were on that tour they might have been i wasn't at that one okay but uh, 
And then I saw them more recently with Soil when we were working a gig doing a festival and they were on with us. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And they 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 know the Soil guys pretty well, which is pretty cool. So like, that's fun. Like I was like, oh, I haven't seen these guys in like years, and let's see what's going on. Because the only original member I believe at that time is just the singer. Uh, the bass player had passed away in like 2015, 14 or something like that. Yeah, but didn't he? I think it was maybe even before that. I thought he died of like a drug overdose. Mm-mm. All right. Somebody of, else died of a drug overdose. It was a like a guitar player that came in later. Yes. So they they lo- they they woke up, which was horrifying, I'm sure. It's around, a pretty sad story. You can find it on Wikipedia. They break the, it down and like ugh. Yeah, this dude, well, I, I, if memory serves, the dude died in their tour bus while they were on tour. Oh, holy shit. They woke shit. up and they he had him o- the next morning. He had overdosed on like a Xanax or some Yeah, they, was, they just say it was like pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical. That yeah. were prescribed to him apparently. Well, the thing is this, which is around this time, it's very important to reference this, which is that whole uh, Motley Crue cocaine heroin lifestyle was going becoming passe, and this new crop were all prescription pill people. And that's why R.I.P. Paul Gray, he apparently died of a similar, he would overdose yeah, from a right? prescription thing. Yeah. And it's so easy to overdose from that because you're you're saying, a doctor gave me this. Right. Yep. A doctor and, gave me medical grade heroin. So how bad can it be? And then yeah. also the concept of it is, from what I hear when people have mishaps with it, it's all, I took something and my body didn't react to it quick enough, so I took another. And then, you know, you, I'm serious. And then yeah. before you know it, six are in your system and you're like, you're ready to die. Yeah. Or, you know, drinking is involved too. Because sure. they even mentioned that story that they were out the night before at a bar drinking, you know. And the guys say like, oh, we only had a couple drinks. But who knows, you know? Because sure. I've but, said I had a couple drinks and that's not a couple drinks. It's like right. 10, who, you know? who knows? That's all hearsay. Yeah. But like, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, you mix that shit together, accidents happen, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, ugh, I can't even imagine that. That'd be fucking crazy to, like, wake up to a band member, like, dead, dead in the fucking, like, van with you. Yeah. Like, holy shit. Yeah, that'd be pretty wild, man. I, mean, I know, that is, that is. That's cause, intense. Because when you hear these rock star death, they're, they're usually, they're separated. Yeah, they're usually at their home or at, at a friend's, you know, it's never on the, the road. The most usually. fucked up one is obviously Cliff Burton. Right, but oh, even yeah. that is something. But you, that was a you know the circumstances. The totally circumstances, different, exactly, you know? and you could pure you know. Yeah, but when it comes down to it, when you're doing, when you're on tour and the guy doesn't wake up, oh my god, yeah, that's that, that sounds horrifying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you know what you want to hear? What's honest too is you know how nowadays an example is this: a band that was probably similarly similar, similarly as popular at at nowadays than as American Heritage was was that band. Um, that was coming up called uh, The Ghost Inside. Oh, you know yeah, the hardcore band? Yeah, yeah so yeah, they sure. were like a similar popular level that were right, whatever. And what happened was Ghost Inside got in a bus crash, and, yeah. one, and one of the dudes lost a leg. Mm-hmm. One of the dudes lost a leg. One of the dudes, like, they all got fucked up. Fucked up, up Roy. Yeah, Andrew, I forget the guy's name. Uh, he's their drummer who used to be in the Michigan hardcore band for the Fallen Dreams, if you guys have ever heard of them. I, yeah. He was their drummer, and then uh, he played with them for a while, and then he ended up jo- like climbing up the ranks and joined the Ghost Inside. What I'm driving at is when you're... Oh, yeah. When when you're in the Ghost Inside, they got so much press and well wishes after that. Oh, like, yeah. Like, keep, keep it going, guys. Continue on. Yeah. They played shows since then. They so the just dude, started playing shows again last year, I believe. And the or, dude is recording and playing mm-hmm. with a prosthetic. Yep. Not a prosthetic leg, but like um like a mechanism or something. Yeah. And that's amazing. It's a triumphant story. But I remember distinctly that dude from American Hair Head Charge died and everyone no one not no one cared, but everyone's like, Oh, that sucks. Yeah. It didn't really move a lot of people. Not at all. Yeah. And they no one said, Keep going, dudes, blah, blah, blah. And they're still together doing it. So the props to them. I believe they're back together yeah because yeah. i mean i think that and you're right i remember checking their wiki page and yeah. they had 30 x members oh a lot. it's so yeah. many like yeah. i think i even saw my name on that right. so i mean i have <laughs> a few friends on there yeah but the, the main two guys were the bass player and the singer and uh it makes me curious as like like i wonder i just wonder who like worked on that album who was like the main writer behind all that stuff because like I, I haven't really listened to their follow-up albums, but this album is definitely the biggest one for them. This is their biggest record, yeah. Um, I'm sure if... Roadrunner put it out, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. If you look at the numbers, I'm sure this one crushes like any other album they've done mm-hmm. since. Which is a lot of times when bands didn't really fulfill their potential. The first one is the one where we're saying, we'll give it a shot. Right. And then the next that one... follow-up's got to be big. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I did check out one of them was like the newer songs called like Loyalty that they had a music video for, and it's actually pretty good. So I was like, all right, maybe the writing isn't that much different, or maybe it's still because that bass player was involved. Who knows? But hey, I think at some point I'm going to delve into the rest of their. The one thing that's cool about this band, The War of Art, was put on on American recordings, and it was oh, produced. Oh, was by, was uh, damn this it. record is produced Where's by Rick, Rick Rubin. Rubin. Yes, so. that's right. Damn it, I should have fucking known that. Bearded legend. <laughs> the the cool thing about this band is. And I love this because I remember I pointed to Orgy and their dark wave, new wave influence. I hear riddled through American Head Charge, they're big ministry fans. Oh, one hundred percent. Oh, ministry and Fear Factory is what and I then, heard the most. And then I I mainly point to I mainly point to ministry because Fear Factory to me always is that those patterns. Yeah, yeah. They don't have they don't really that. fuck yeah. with that. They just do straight fucking old school ministry industrial. Yeah, and it's all over the fucking place. Yeah. And I love when bands took Ministry was arguably the biggest in the eighties and they grew up on that, I'm assuming, mm-hmm. and then worked it into their version of New Metal. Yeah. Really fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I, I was very interested. Uh I mean, I put I so American Head Charge, I always and probably still will after this episode get them confused with head P E two head new metal bands and head from Korn. and head from yeah Fair they enough. get confused between the person we'll and the bands do. there should oh, be a shirt head there P somewhere. was one i wanted to do but unfortunately the album that i like broke it's not on spotify right it is but it's like a fucking edited uh, version, edited version uh, which is kind of a bummer i don't i don't have a problem with doing that one i'll find uh, it i mean yeah, like okay. i have yeah, it on cd guess, do you yeah like, I, broke I, is I the think, shit bartender was their big song off that yeah. and swan dive swan dive's awesome the shit swan dive is a song that is so triumphantly depressing that it's just awesome which one had the video music Bar- video Bar- that was Center. tied in with uh three thousand miles of graceland oh that's right something that's something. a deep cut that a, <laughs> the, the, that's a great movie that you Court, probably never Court, seen Court, Court, never david arcana thinks in it and i think courtney cox or whatever he had a song courtney in the movie? cox uh what's um, his name they're uh, all like elvis and person slater and, yeah, and yeah. he had a song in the movie yeah yeah because it came out right, right oh, around it when was, metal was i think it was i think it was bartender I don't think it was Bartender. I think okay. it was another one. It might have been Bartender, and there's two music videos uh, where they have fucking scorpions fighting. Broke it's it, insane. Broke is the shit, though. That's like, a great it's album. A, it's well, a fun. Anyway, I love that album. I've never heard American Head of Charge before this. I've never heard a song like that. I'm not surprised by yeah. that at all. I've heard their name. Like I said, I would get them confused with Head P.E., so I didn't know. My first reaction to the very first song, A Violent Chain. Uh, violent reaction. A violent, violent reaction, reaction, which is a cool song. That was probably really my cool favorite song. on the album. Great opener. Like, I just remember thinking, like, wow, this is like way fucking heavy for a new metal band. And the singer reminds me of fucking Burton. He reminds me of Burton. Like, that's that's the vibe I got. Like, he would do like the weird style singing eventually. Um, but his screaming reminded me of Burton a lot, which I liked a lot. And I liked like this this album was kind of weird for me because I, I started out being like, whoa, I might really like this. Then the more I got, whoa, the, yeah, hold on. The Pump more, the, I, the more I got into it, I was just I like, was. oh no, what? Jason. <laughs> I've actually done that before, where I start listening to something and I need to press stop because I go, yeah. this might be something I really like, yeah. and I need to make sure I'm in the right place at the right time because I'm not. You, you only get one shot at yeah. a first, like anything, you yeah. know. Where I, the first time you hear a band that you're like, I might really dig. I need to be in the right place at the right time yeah. when I do this. Uh, I thought of something really, really interesting, and this is why it's so fucking amazing. Which is the there's nothing like in the world thinking of movies, seeing a movie for the first time in a theater mm-hmm. for the first time. I saw this like if I saw this movie for the first time, it was in the theater. There's nothing like it. Yeah. And that experience is going away. And yeah. now people are doing this thing where they say, I saw that movie on fucking Netflix or whatever, blah, blah, blah. It was cool. Now I'm gonna go see it in the theater. It's like you already lost it. Yeah, you what? lost the battle. Yeah, why would you because go see it in the theater? They might probably really liked it, yeah. but it's because they didn't want to get off their ass initially. Yeah, and they said, "I don't want to risk the money or whatever that whole thing." But there's no, there's nothing like that experience. Yeah. You can't get it back because there's only one first time to see or experience everything. Yep, that's very that's- true. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, I started listening to it. Then, um, as soon as the guy started singing, I was like, "I can't. I'm not in it. I'm not into the, his singing." But um. The first half of the record I felt like was really like aggressive. And I was like, okay, like I could kind of hang with this. Like, this is not like I've definitely liked this more than other albums we've picked on this show before that I haven't heard of. Um, but by the time we reached the second half of the album, like I started I was losing steam because A, again, it's a long record, but B, I started noticing that there was I can't remember 
which songs they were specifically by name, but there was a couple songs like back to back that almost sounded identical where they were like, chorus is really heavy, and then we slow down at the very end and it's really heavy, but the verses are all quiet, sung, like simple verses. And I was just like, oh, this band is just doing that? Like, what happened to this crazy shit that was going on at the beginning where the guy's just like screaming in my face and it felt super aggressive? But it, it's still like, it's it, because I looked it up and it's like, all right, this is it. Once again, it's like one of those records where I feel like it's more rooted in industrial music, like Ministry or like maybe Fear Factory is kind of a stretch, but you know, something like that. Um, as opposed to like, it's not, it, to me, at least my first reaction was that it wasn't overtly new metal y, like in a corny way, if that makes any sense. And I'm not trying to say that to any offensive degree by any means, but like, it didn't strike me as that way. I was like, oh, this band is kind of hard. Like, they're kind of heavy. Like, more than I expected, at least. Definitely. Because we've done, like, a a good example, and I'm not knocking it, but it's like, remember we did the first Finger Eleven record? Like, that record, to me, like, I could see how they came more out of that alternative rock angle, where it's like, it is heavy, but it's like a lot of singing. This is more of, like, a lot of screaming and a lot of just, like, on 10 a lot of the time. Yes, it was, uh, it's an aggressive metal. Yeah. It, It was them. There was, around this time, new metal bands were coming out that were kind of fucking aggressive. Yeah. Chimera, for example, is another one that I came out around this time. And that band is pretty, was pretty fucking punishing. And then yeah. it got more consistently punishing. And then they worked in a little hate breed, that whole thing afterwards. And then kind of did their own thing. And I think they're still, I don't even know if Chimera's Chimera, still they're around. not a band anymore. They haven't been for a while. <laughs> yeah. That band was, they had some really, that's they had a, some awesome. That's a band shit. that, Bill mentioned it, which is that follow-up record is very important because they had a first record called Pass Out of Existence. Yeah, which for, rec- for the record, I love that album. The yeah, awesome. album, right? As yeah. well as the follow-up, no, too. The follow-up and is just as good. Vastly different. I know. And I th- in my eyes, they're, they're different albums. That follow-up is tight, but man. It's so good. And yeah. then that's another band that started adding the double bass into new metal, even though Mudvayne was the first. Yeah. And started adding... There's that song Pure Hatred, which has bump la bump a bana ba bump la bump a bana bum bump. It's a badass beat. And uh that's one of their best songs or whatever. But it was new uh new metal was going more the aggressive fuck you traditional oh, yeah. metal way with bands like American Head Charge Chimera. Obviously Slipknot did it too. Yeah. But uh yeah, I mean it, American Head Charge is a great example of that. Yeah, I didn't really know that. Because Chimera, when I listened to them, Resurrection was out. So that's uh, when they were doing like the full on like metal. just metal metal. Yeah. Like we're like <laughs> gonna tour with Devil worship. Driver and <laughs> Lamb of God type shit. Like the new wave of American heavy metal angle. They were a weird band that Chimera should be talked about on the show, but they were a band that started in new metal and then yeah. jumped onto that. Yeah. And quickly too. Quickly, yeah. They had some cool records. Their self title had Kevin Talley on drums, like yes. which was sick. All right, like, everyone always mentioned that guy. That guy is hold on, let me, don't tell me. Kevin <laughs> Talley was in fuck. He was in Skinless for a minute. I know that. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And then what was the big band he was in, though? Uh, Doth was technically yes, Doth. his yes. band. Okay, yeah. yes, yes, was yes. Like, he was like an OG of that band. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Skinless is another band that got ripped off to shit with the slam death metal thing from all those... Yeah. Whatever. Oh yeah. Big Skinless time. was the shit. Well, Kevin Talley used to be like the death metal like fill in guy. He was the guy. He the played guy. with Black Dahlia. He played with Suffocation. I want to say he played with Obituary. He played with Job for a Cowboy. He's played with like a fuckload of bands. He's done session drumming for countless bands. Hmm. And he joined Chimera as like a permanent member. Like he did their self titled with them, which I want to say was on Roadrunner, and then left. And hmm. then they did Resurrection with uh, that dude Andals Herrick or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, interesting. Interesting, because that does make sense now. Because like American Head Charge is a band that I wouldn't know how to classify because I've never heard them before. And it's like, you know, uh, I know. Well, they might still be a band, but it says that like they only have like four records, and their last one came out in 2016. So it doesn't sound like an ever expansive career. Because Chimera had like a fuckload of albums, um, yeah, a ton, yeah, almost. It's got to be close to ten before they were done. Yeah, yeah. they were consistent. Yeah. And but the records, band, like, because of all the fucking member changes, I mean, that's got to make it hard to be like, oh, now it's time to write. And an Chimera album. had yeah. a bunch of member changes too. It's just that that one dude, Mark Hunter, was always the guy piecing it together, and he was able to do it. Mark and Rob, those two. Yeah, Rob. Like the, yeah, that's right. The, Rob plays the bass. Backbone. No guitar. Oh, that's right. And yeah. Then, actually, that bass player was there for a good while. Didn't um, Rob play guitar for a minute in some other band that was like a death metal huge band? Huge band. 
Yeah. Um, six feet under. Six feet under. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. He yeah. played on an album. Yeah, I yeah. have that album yes. that he's on. Which is I very saw him. I think he does like Twitch or YouTube or something. That's his bread and butter. Yeah, Rob him. used to work in in Westchester. Apparently, at a music, he was teaching music lessons. Yeah, there. that's right. And I think he lives in Westchester. I think so. Or uh, Lagrange or, or something like that. That's funny. Yeah, Westchester. There has, was a while he was popping up on my uh, people you should know on Facebook, and I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm a boy. <laughs> well, he quit Chimera, and they did like four records without him, three or four. Mm. Chimera is yeah, worshipped in Cleveland still. I believe it. Oh yeah, and they do the Christmas then, show. Chimera Christmas, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's Chimera and and uh, Mushroomhead are the bands in Cleveland that everyone says are the shit. We've done them on this show. I picked them. I uh, think so Chicago has a couple yeah. of those bands. Macabre is huge. In Chicago. Yeah, which I don't get. No, I, I definitely get it. I fucking love <laughs> Macabre, man. Do you really? Yeah. yeah. And every time I see it, I think of me being a kid. And Okay, that's fair. Uh, it's just, it's just, Gabe, listen, Gabe and I's band fucking played with Macabre uh, at a, a Holiday Horror show, Holiday Horror 3, or, I don't even know, oh, it was wow. a million years ago. And the funny thing is this, which is, I remember distinctly, uh, we're in, our band was called Psycho Scapegoat, and uh, we were titling our record around that time and the singer of our band was essentially the leader and it was kind of you either went his way or he would cry about it one of Uh, those things i'm i people say well you're the same way gobo and i'm like no i'm not like you you were you had to be in the room dude like (laughs) and that's why gabe could fucking vouch for it because he's been in the room with both of us and it's like when i get labeled in the same boat i'm not that Long story short is he wanted to call our record Suffer for the Art. And I said to him distinctly, we can't call it that. We can't call it that because this new band came on American Head Charge and their, wars, their name's called The War of Art. Yeah. I'm like, we can't have two arts. And he goes, I don't know. I think there's enough for it. And I go, I'm just saying, I don't, you know my stamp of approval on it because yeah. of this whole thing. And I'm sure that's the one thing I'm really adamant on, which is if you say, don't do that, I, was, I will say why. And then please come with an answer. Yeah. And I said, Here's my thesis. This yeah. record just came out. It's called The War of Art. It's going to be big. Yeah. Don't fucking do this. We can't have two art names going on at yeah. the same time. And our records, if you look at them, probably came out within the same year of each other. Is that what you called it? They called it, yeah. We, Suffering for the art? Su- suffer for the art. Nice. Which I don't back because of that whole chimera. Sure. Part, I mean, that American Yeah, that's thing. really funny. Wow. <laughs> really funny, dude. Damn, that's an interesting it, little man. story <laughs> about titling, titling <laughs> records. Uh, I did see... <laughs> American Head Charts, I saw them a few times, but uh, they played one tour distinctly. It was them, Slayer, and Chimera, who we mentioned all in the show today. So it was uh, Slayer headlining, obviously, Chimera direct support, American Head Charge. Wow. Charge, so it was a good one. Cool. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Yeah, it's a cool record. I thought it was fun. Like, listening to it, I got tired by the end of it, but that's, again, <laughs> it's another one of those <laughs> things fair. where it's, like, a lot of songs on it, and it's just, like, a beefy record to get through. And I, like I said, I, it's cool if you're a fan of that band. Same thing with Mudvayne, where it's just, like, you get so much music from this band, and if you love them, that's awesome. You know, like that's so cool because I mean, today's standards, like that's like two albums in one. Like you said, it's like a yeah. double album. So, and, th- and then today's standards, it's a fucking joke, which is like, <laughs> like a re- your average record. I'll just say this straight up: is one and a half songs are worthy. Yeah, which is usually the opening song and ha- like usually the second song, probably. Yeah, and then you don't know what you're getting after that. Yep. Yeah. When it's something great, I say embrace it so hard and tell the world about it. Yeah. Where it's consistent and it's well fucking rounded. Other than that, the attention span of the average fan has gone down. Yeah. Pro- but it's the chicken and the egg. Has the attention span of the fan gone down because the records were getting inconsistent after the first two tracks? Or vice versa, where it's, all right, the, the records are going to be inconsistent because we know people aren't listening past track one and two. So what's yeah. the fucking point? Yep. Yep. I don't know. You know it is an interesting. interesting. Th- yeah. But I will say this, which is any band, and believe me, everyone here um, stands by it. We put out records that I back start to finish. I talked to oh, fucking, yeah. I, I talked to Nate Madden at my house this week, and I said, I backed your fucking last record with Immortal Bird a lot because it was start to finish good, I thought. Yeah. And I would tell you straight up if it wasn't, because I'd said it pattered out. It didn't. Yeah. So, like, congrats, you did it. Yeah. But so many bands just fucking phone in after first couple tracks. Yep. And... They don't even give you the bang for your buck where it's like, we're going to phone it in, but we're going to give you 16 tracks. They give you seven tracks and an interlude. And yeah. <laughs> after two, it's a phone in. Yeah. Like, like it's a 
an episode of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is phone a friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that reminds me of that wave of bands, and I was just thinking about it, uh, that wave of bands from like 2008, 2009-ish, where it was like Burning the Masses and Conducting from the Grave. And uh, I mean, most those are like the two bands I could think of, but like their first like Conducting from the Grave son is Sumerian, and their first record had like their entire last EP re-recorded on it, and then maybe like three new songs. And I remember thinking at the time, like, oh, I love that. I like this band a lot. I'm looking forward to this and being bummed because I was like, I've heard all these songs. Yeah, I've heard all these. these before. Yeah. So I'm like, why am I listening to this again? This is so weird and stupid. And then Burning the Masses, it was the same thing. Their EP, they re- re-recorded like four of the songs on it. I mean, but then they had a lot more new songs on the first album. So that was cool. But still, I remember always thinking like, that must be it. Like you're a band, a death metal band. You put out an EP, then a label likes you, so you re-record most of that EP and add a couple new songs, and there's your debut. Is your full length? You know, yeah. yeah. And then also, people say it's hard to write fucking songs. It's really not. No. You just have to be good and focused when you do it. Yeah. And it sucks getting in a room and banging it out, knowing when to hold a riff, knowing when to fold it. But you gotta fucking know <laughs> like the back of your hand, and if you yeah. do it, you will write good songs. Nice. You'll write cons- not even good songs, consistent songs, or whatever your band's putting out. If you suck at music, you're, it's going to be hard to write good songs. But sure. if you're good at it and you focus on songwriting and how to fucking do it, you'll know good ones from bad. Oh, definitely. That really, uh, And a lot of people need to learn. I guess we, they need to learn that lesson, but we all learn it the hard way when we listen to a bad record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit, I bought this. Fuck. Yeah. Two and a half good songs. So American Head Charge is like one of those bands I feel that just fell to the wayside. Like, they didn't really get much... I don't know. I it feels like they didn't really get that much attention. Some bands are snake bit. Yeah, it's, you can have everything thrown at you at the right time. Rick Rubin's label, mm-hmm. new metal blowing up, and it just doesn't fucking click for X, Y, or Z reason. Yeah. And that's it. And that's just what it is. Yeah, I wonder why Rick Rubin like was about this one. This band, I didn't. Well, didn't I couldn't uh, find a lot about it. Once again, Sean from Slipknot have something to do with this band. I don't. If he did, that's a great point. I thought there point. was a connection. There was a connection. Right? Because isn't he in like the music, one of their music videos? And there is some tie in. There is some tie in. That's <clears> correct. Yeah. Sean and them. I don't know. I couldn't find anything on this album that tied them in because, like, oh. I, it didn't mention him. It just said Rick Rubin and they recorded it at their at his allegedly haunted recording studio. <laughs> yeah, which or is something. where Slipknot recorded volume three. Okay. That's not Shangri La. Where is that Shangri La? I, I don't know the name of it, but actually, no, Slipknot, I think, recorded at another haunted place, which was the ex Harry Houdini mansion in, in L.A. Okay. Which might even be, I'm Ruben might own a part of it, I don't know. Sure. But um, I thought about this recently, which Dude, was... Pete's going to have to step up his game and get a haunted fucking <laughs> studio. Whoa. I, I'm reading on Wikipedia, the album landed American Head Charge a spot at OzFest 2001, their concerts featured some controversy due to the band firing shotguns and burning American flags on stage. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Some controversy. I, that's all I see. That's all I can see here. <laughs> There's two music videos. You guys remember to load the shotguns in the trailer? Are, are you sure you're not reading the bio for body count? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'm not. That'd be sick. Um, yeah, check out the video. I'll, I'll, all right. I've load been... the shotguns up. <laughs> so leading up to these episodes, I've been trying to post video music videos from like the albums we picked. Sure. And one of them, um, it's actually one of my favorite songs in the album. Is it all wrapped up? Yeah. Uh, Michael Rooker is in it. Don't know what? him. What? Really? It's Mary Poppins from Guardians of the Galaxy. Don't know him. Yeah, Michael Rooker. <laughs> I know Michael Rooker. You, you know. would totally know, you know him. You saw him, uh, Remember Mallrats? Yes. Do you remember the... the, the I know everything about that movie. So. <laughs> the, the bald dude that was like trying to run the show, the father. He was oh, that guy's That's awesome. Michael Rooker. Yeah, yeah that yeah, guy's yeah. hilarious. He was in... He's he in was, a music video. He was, in a, he was another bad guy in another film that was... He's like a dastardly bad dude. Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was in Cliffhanger. Uh, dude, his his resume is like insane. Yeah, he's and I'm bummed because I couldn't find like an IMDb for the music video. Just curious. Oh, with him yeah. on it. Yeah, because they do that sometimes on there. But... He's such a creep in Mallrats. Oh, he's the best. Like creepy man. dad. You like he's pretzel? in that. Yeah. You, know, you guys ever see Slither? Yeah, yeah. That was really good. He's, he's in, in it. that. Yeah. Yes, he is. Yeah. That's right. Okay, cool. Yeah, he's in he plays like a redneck who like uh, is heavily infested with. The slither virus or yeah whatever. some shit like that really fucking cool hey he's been in a lot of shit man he was in he was on the walking dead for a bit he right? was yeah so that's crazy he was in an american head charge video yeah fuck i wanted and that was like video. he was like an actor like yeah he was doing well then so it was kind of funny wow. that they managed to pull that interesting yeah i wonder why i still like i couldn't find a lot of information on why rick rubin was like vouching for them but 
Maybe you just thought it was cool. Because they didn't pan out like System of a Down did. Oh, no. No, not yeah. really. It sucks because Rick, even Rick Rubin doesn't have the perfect record. Yeah. You know, no pun intended because he records records. But <laughs> he hits way more times than he doesn't. Yeah. And, the, you know, the rest is history. The, the list is insane, you know. Yeah. Whether it be, and it's versatile. So it's anything from LL Cool J to Slayer to System. It's a lot of fucking people that he brought to BC, oh, yeah. BC Boys. Crazy. Crazy amount of shit. Well, like I said, like, I don't know. I think the writing on the album was really great. Yeah, there's some Very cool catchy shit. stuff. Yeah. The, the formula's there that they use, and it works out really well. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there was just so much turmoil in the band that probably led to them not okay. to be as big as they were. Because obviously with, like, members leaving and being fired, I'm sure that's caused them to, you know, turn away from tours or, you know, like, shit like that. That's probably what really fucked them over in the long One run. One of the biggest examples of this is... um there was a band, maybe some of your listeners know them from the early 90s, called Brainiac. Brainiac was, there's a documentary on them that explains the, all the reasons they were fucking snake bit. But they were so influential, and they were basically, for lack of a better description, what kind of At The Drive-In was doing well, well before At The Drive-In. Okay. So they were, uh, those guys, they're interviewed, the At The Drive-In dudes are interviewed in the docu- documentary, and oh. they're saying this they were such an influence to us. They're just like chaotic, uh, mathy nonsense, basically. Sure. And they just fucking crushed. And it would be, oh, we we did this record and it was on a shitty label. Oh, well, we didn't sign the contract on time. Oh, we got in a crash. One, the, their member, their a force when they were like about to, um, their writing force, the their front man. Yeah. Got he didn't even get in a car accident. This is actually really sad. He bought like a jalopy, like a shitty car, yeah. and fucking. He, I'm pretty sure, asphyxiated himself in the car, passed out, and then hit a tree and died. Oh, holy fuck. Yeah, so, and that's right before they were about to get, like, finally blow up. Wow. And then the band ended. Holy fuck. It's a great documentary. I forget what it's called, but it's just, look up Brainiac documentary. Oh, yeah. But sometimes, again, you're just snake bit, and it's not the right time for you, and no matter what you do, you just are fighting up and uphill battle the whole fucking time, because it doesn't click. There's some dudes that suck, but they're in the right place at the right time, and then they find themselves in a great position, and then maybe make it work. Mm-hmm. They're like, people kind of like us now. Oh, yeah. we just made a fucking uh, whatever cool hit, I guess, and then we have uh, a four-album deal now to a great you know, yeah. thing. Yeah, weird. I mean, you figure you tour with Slayer, you're probably up there. But Oh, yeah. I mean, those tours are, you know, Lamb of God tour with Slayer, and they were never the same afterwards. They just fucking became huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They yeah. probably rival Slayer in popularity now. Now, yeah. Like, they're so fucking big. Good for them. Lamb yeah. of God. Success story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lamb of God killing it right now with Art Cruz on drums. <laughs> yeah. What was he in? He, Winds of Plague. Winds of Plague, and Prong. dude. And Prong. He, yeah. I, I, I saw He's him, in Prong now. I saw him play with Prong. I, yeah. I bet you he doesn't go back to Prong. I think at this point. It's, I hope. Yeah, I hope he sticks with But him. I saw him play with Prong at fucking Bottom Lounge, and he fucking killed it. Nice. And then I, uh, a year later, they said, we're taking the drummer from Prong, yeah. and we're doing Lamb of God, basically. Yeah. I saw him. I saw him with Winds of Plague. Actually, the first time I saw Winds of Plague at the Savage Event Center up in Elgin, it was as Blood Runs Black, Veil of Maya, The Ghost Inside, Winds of Plague. Holy fuck! And I want to say with Dead Hands Rising, maybe something like that. It was weird, mm. weird show. What's School, up with this though. venue out here? We, uh, the West Chest, Westchester Music Circle, or whatever. Are you thinking West Chicago Social Club? Yes, West Chicago yeah. Social Club. Is that <laughs> around here? No, 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 it's way, f- it's closer to like Naperville and shit. What the fuck yeah. is that venue about? Uh, weird. I went, that was the last show I went to, was Beneath the Massacre and Origin, uh, at, at how, West Chicago Social Club. How was that club. attended? Uh, pretty like well. Pretty good, more yeah. well than I expected. Yeah, pretty well. Those, I mean, those bands are great and people, I, that show was not promoted well, but no. people would. Travel for that if they. If oh they yeah, do I did. Uh, we just all wanted to see Beneath the Massacre again. Yeah, yeah. We were just like, "Fuck, let's go." And also, Origin kicks ass live. Oh yeah, they were awesome. unbelievable. I can't believe I that band's been around doing They played. Oh jeez. Yeah, they were on that show too. That's yeah. a good last show. Yeah, it was an awesome <laughs> last show. Yeah. Yeah, it was killer. There was a good. It was like if that show would have been at Reggie's, it would probably would have had a slightly bigger turnout, but like probably not that far off. Yeah, I'm just, I'm really surprised it didn't go down at Reggie's. Our last show that I was at was one we played, which was. We played with Bongzilla the night that shit fucking hit. They, they almost, like, we were loaded in and hearing about it. They were like, this, all, sh- all shows are canceled. All shit. <laughs> yeah, fuck. Hey, it's going to be final blow over in 14 days. I remember thinking that, too. 
So nope. yeah, we all did. <laughs> yeah. A lot of us did. It was those of us that believed in it. Broadcasting <laughs> from you. the second half of February 2021 here. Crazy. Yeah. Um, eventually, uh, we'll be okay. Yeah. Eventually. We will. I don't know if you've been vaccinated yet, but I'm sure we've all been vaccinated, right? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we're all high-end commodities in this world. And yeah. They value us and... <laughs> we'll get it. I think I'm. I think I'm scheduled on a fifth tier. Um, as really? Far, yeah, right behind OJ. How do, <laughs> is he? Is, yeah. <laughs> actually, right I, or I'm right in front of one of the two. Okay. But I'm in the OJ bracket. Of, cool. We really don't care if you live and die. Dude. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't even have to fucking kill <laughs> I, your I don't, wife. I don't work for anyone. Allegedly. So yeah. I don't work for anyone, and on paper, I don't look as a safe bet to keep around. So it's like, all right, you're. <laughs> Meaning Dude. the reason they give vaccines to a janitor working in hospitals, is they don't want to infect the doctors. Sure. And they don't patients. really care about the janitor. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, no, I mean, well, whatever. But when it comes down to it, it's they don't want I don't brush I don't need to brush shoulders with anyone on paper. Therefore, they're like, fuck this guy. Yeah. You know? Same. If you one thing I will say is this, which is what's interesting is sign up for these websites that and put your radius large. They like say, for example, if you this will everyone out there, I mean, take this advice. Fucking Put a 40 mile radius that you'll drive to to get it vaccinated. If they get a shipment to some weird area and they're look, looking for motherfuckers, they might alert you and you get a vac- vaccination. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because the, uh, the thing is, this too, which is the key to this whole thing is sometimes you're not taking a person's spot who needs it. And I'll explain what I mean. The vaccination, the vaccine itself spoils. So yeah. if they get a bunch of it and they're like, we need to fucking juice up some motherfucker and they're waiting. You're in the mix, and yeah. it's going to spoil no matter what. So yeah. just do what you can. Sam just got her second COVID shot the other day. Awesome. So nice. She's in the in the clear. That's badass. One day. Yeah. Well, she's a me- medical worker. She works for a dental office, so she was able to just show up to Jewel with her paycheck or pay stub. Wow. And, like, her doctor hooked it up for her. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the nice. dentist there just hooked it up for her. He was like, yeah, just go to this Jewel and, like, carry this, and then they'll get you one. I contemplated. I told was telling Maiden Emma. Nate, Nate Madden about this. Uh, I contemplated just getting a job as a janitor at a hospital just to get vaccinated <laughs> and then fucking quitting. <laughs> yeah, you probably could. I mean, with, by July, you should be good. Yeah, I think by the summer, they said people in our age. So what should I do? It. Should I wait till the summer, get vaccinated, or get a job as a janitor for presumably a couple of weeks, get vaccinated, Whatever's fucking fast. up and quit? That one, yeah, that one is sicker. <laughs> we'll document it, too. I mean, there's nowhere to go still yeah. right now. So get a job, really learn matter. the ropes of... Uh, how to be a janitorial manager of a hospital. Then, arts. Yeah. And then get uh, your vaccination. It only takes a couple of weeks and then bam, be like, hey, what guys, if I end I'll up liking you. being a janitor of a hospital, though? And then I get that'll be a new crib. <laughs> I mean, then. <laughs> like a reverse. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you like movie, being a janitor yeah. in a hospital? I don't know, man. What's the movie? It's the movie have... Matt Damon's a janitor and he turns out to be a genius. It's like a oh, reverse. Good Will Hunting. Good Will Hunting. Yeah. It's like a reverse. Uh, there's that... I love being a janitor. No, you know, there's, that, there's that scene in Set Brothers where uh, <laughs> John C. Riley's in therapy and he's like, tell me a little bit about yourself. And he's like, well, I'm a janitor at a high school. I uh, sometimes see an equation on a board and it's just, I figure it out. And he's like, that's the plot of Good Will Hunting. Yeah. Goes, and he goes, no, it's not. And he goes, um... My best friend's Ben Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very sick. That's a good movie, man. Good no, Will Hunting. No, and Step Brothers. And yeah, Step Brothers, Step Brothers too. is too. Step Brothers might be better than a good movie. Like that. That's pretty fucking oh, yeah. phenomenal. I like the scene in Good Will Hunting where Matt Damon's like knowledge battling that dude in the bar for that chick. And then he goes, he what? puts the number up and he goes, "You like apples? How about them apples?" Yeah, sick. That's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> uh, quick Step Brothers story, which is. The first time I heard about Step Brothers, swear to God, and people were on the tour with me. They fucking know Pete, like Pete from Muzzler. This is on a Muzzler tour. We were driving through Brooklyn, and if you go through um, uh, New York, Chicago, whatever, you know those walls were just covered in posters for promo. Yeah, movie posters, bands, whatever bullshit. Um, uh, like clothing companies. I saw one of John C. Riley and uh, fucking Will Ferrell, and they're in the sweaters with the family pose or whatever, and I just go. Oh my god! And everyone's like, "What?" And I just go, "I saw something," and that was, and it came out like six months later. It was yeah. like the first wave of press wow. for that movie. I go, "That looks fucking hilarious." And I was describing it to everyone, and they're like, "You saw Will Ferrell in a sweater?" And I was like, "Yes, like, damn, awesome. that was cool. That's nuts." Know. Yeah, that's probably one of his biggest movies. Real, I mean, he's had a he's had a lot of big. Elf is probably his biggest one. Oh yeah, because it's all that family shit where it's the mom's Anchorman love was it. pretty big too. Anchor Anchorman was big. 
Yeah. Step Brothers might be Anchorman level, but it's all about Elf because everyone just loves that. Yeah. It's Zoe De- huge Zoe Deschanel with fucking Will Ferrell. Direct- yeah. Directed by John Favreau, who's another darling of American cinema. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with never and seeing Bob that movie Newhart. again. But... Yeah, that, yeah, Bob Newhart and fucking Mary, um, not Mary, uh, Mary Steenburgen might be the mom. Who's mm-hmm. all, she's the no, mom and yeah. Step Brothers. She's the mom and Step Brothers. Yeah, she's the mom and Step Brothers. And then James Caan is the dad yes. in fucking yeah. Who apparently Elf. hated being that movie he, yeah, <laughs> he, really? he fucking liked that pe- he paycheck and will the residuals ferrell. yeah <laughs> he like hated wow. will ferrell i love how you just deadpan yeah. straight up wait when you edit this make sure to focus on your Dude, camera I, if i remember no please no <laughs> Re- email him if he doesn't i need that line you gotta see your face he said he hated will ferrell yeah. i was gonna be a new gif i make <laughs> that's so um, fucking good you guys think why that, would he hate who hates will you think ferrell that elf oh, and misery have energy. lineage together like do you think that there's james a tie-in yeah like it's james Conn's character. character yeah later he's in a life. publisher yeah in that movie oh that's so awesome so it's like he it's has a, a kid and it's, it's i don't think that's actually sequel. it but that would be sick if it was um yeah the other side of it too is um there's <laughs> people say that the urban legend is that the care uh the movie saw yeah was based off Kevin kevin McAllister and home right. alone oh yeah, that's the follow-up yeah. sick i've never heard i've that. never i've never read or watched the theories behind that but i've heard they're pretty strong that's they're pretty funny. funny yeah that's crazy like if he just Jigsaw snapped and then is, is, uh, Kevin is Kevin Kevin <laughs> <laughs> damn no, that is pretty fucking awesome yeah well that's like james Conn survives the godfather doesn't he get killed in that he, he gets killed yeah. he gets killed in the uh, f- um in a toll booth so I you think. don't see it but he survives that toll booth he does yeah, that's right okay and then he becomes a writer and no, he doesn't. They do Misery, and right. then he As becomes the a publisher, last, yeah. and then Elf. Misery is so good. Yeah, I yeah. love that movie. That's a great Stephen King film adaptation. Yeah. There was some tour Warforged did where all we did was just, like, send each other a clip of him <laughs> getting hobbled. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. over and over again. Really, really fucking yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> that shit is fucked up. I yeah. love that movie. I saw that when I was really young, too. Did you ever... I've met particularly women in my life that are really obsessed with fans yeah to the point where i'm like you're borderline kathy bates if you ever oh, had a hold yeah. of one right. of these people crash they, at a place yeah you know, make so you stay there. strange it's so strange yeah. my sister my sister worked with a person um at a, at a law firm once that was a v- mental and a victim of catfish early oh. on to the point where she thought she swore to god to my sister a million fucking times that she was married to the guy uh him billy vallow yes and she had a vial of blood around her neck that he sent her in the mail. But it wasn't him. It was a catfish. And, and my sister's she got like, married? No, she, was, she said she was married to Billy Vallow. Oh, but she wasn't actually married. She was talking with him online, and it was a ca- fucking catfish. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yes, I so see what this, you're saying. <laughs> this happened, and my sister- She has a vial of blood? Yeah, it was, it was some blood. yeah some lunatic center of Alba, and she was dead convinced. And my sister goes, my sister kept trying to convince her, like, you're no not way. married to the guy from him. Yeah. And then she wouldn't hear it. And then eventually, my sister um like quit the job, and she goes, I guess that's one for the books. I'll never. I yeah. Know. Oh my god, I would there, need closure on I that. Know. And then what happened was she, my sister would say to me every time I would see her, she goes, this chick still thinks she's married to fucking the guy from him. She's out of her fucking mind. That's nuts. First wave of catfishing. Yeah. Oh wow. The vampire the heart. OG catfishing. Razor Blade Romance, Vampire Heart. Is that him shit? Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, I know. I know Bam liked him. Yeah. That's all I know. <laughs> That's the only thing I know about it. Him. I liked uh, Dark Light, the album by him that had Wings of a Butterfly on it. That was it, that was song. one of their biggest songs. You would definitely know. That's a really good pop e song. It reminds me of a song that like a band like Ghost would do. Yeah, yeah, it does remind me of something Ghost would do. <laughs> yeah. Ghost at Ew. this point kind of sucks. Sucks. Like it's uh, man, actually not yeah. at this point. They just suck. Yeah. I, <laughs> like when I, I I saw Ghost first time live in Chicago, the first time they were ever they ever played Chicago ever. I was there at Bottom Lounge. Yeah. Beyond sold I out. I remember. And I remember saying everyone was freaking. Was, didn't Enslaved play that show? Oh no, they were they were supposed to play in that. No, here's what happened. Enslaved. It was supposed to be Enslaved and Ghost doing a yeah. co-headliner. Ghost. Not 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 even a co-headliner. Ghost was like supposed to open. Okay. And Slave was for sure supposed to headline. And then Ghost had this meteoric rise. They had to drop off the tour because they're like, we can't play with Enslaved because A, we got, I guess, headline now. B, we're in a situation where Enslaved has a lot of fans. 
So we're going to sell out every club we fucking book because we're blowing the fuck up. Yeah. They drop it. They reschedule a bottom line show. Pete, Pete Grossman and I went there. We went. To we see Ghost? Yeah. Him and I, we went. We were recording a record together. I think a Jarred Loose record. And then him and I went after we finished the sesh. We, like, drove to Bottom Lounge. And we both had fun. But I remember saying everyone around me is having way too much fun. Like, this band is <laughs> not as insanely good as yeah. we're, we're treating them like they're Metallica. Yeah. Like, this is crazy. Like, I mean, they're not that good. But they are, like, cool. But that just already was a red flag. And then I just kind of separated myself a little bit. And they went very, very poppy after that. And they're, I'm, assume, I'm assuming, particularly in Europe, they're monstrous. Oh, I'm sure. Like I it, remember I first saw Ghost, like, because uh, I remember I almost went to that show because I love Enslaved, and I was going to see them. And yeah, I'm like, oh, I'll cool. check out this band, Ghost. That's how I found out about Ghost, because they were supposed to support that tour. And I remember seeing a picture of them and thinking, like, holy fuck, I bet this band sounds like Behemoth on, like, crack yeah. or something. Because they look so what the evil. Fuck? Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, this is some like merciful fate worship or something. Yeah, and I and was like, Blue Oyster Cult yeah. worship. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I, know. I try to like it, but I, I can't get behind it. The first time I heard it, I was on tour with Roman Ring and Joe, our drummer at the time, liked that band. And uh-huh. he's playing it in the van. And I was like, what the fuck is Sounds this? Sounds like the Beatles. Kind of. It's like surf Here rock meets the Beatles. Didn't they yeah, they did a cover of oh Here Comes God. the Sun. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Joe was like, this is Ghost. I was like, this is the, the band that like everybody is, band. is like shitting their pants yeah. over. And he's like, yeah, yeah, they're like huge. And I was like, this is the band that wears the masks and all that stuff. And he's yeah. like, yeah. And I was like, what happened? I was like, this is, I was just shocked. Yeah. I, they should like, be sounding you, like Dia side. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, this is going to be some like heavy ass, Scary like, all shit. right. Let's. Yeah. And I never like, looked into <laughs> it. I was just, because it got so popular. I was yeah. like, I don't care. And then when I finally just accidentally heard it, I was like, oh, this is even more disappointing for me personally. Yeah. Because this I guy's not blasting total disappointment. at 285 beats per minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, the funny thing the is, Ghost blast. had, this is the main reason why Ghost catered to metal fans. Uh-huh. People who just like heavy heavy metal, and the girls definitely liked them. And yeah. then that makes the boys like them more because they're like, <sighs> babes, like will, babes yeah. will be at their shows as opposed to a deicide show where there's three chicks in the whole fucking place. <laughs> I want to go there. I, I, I want to go, I want to see Deicide again, period. Hell like, yeah. I, I want to see anyone, but Deicide, I, last time I saw him again was like probably about six years, five years ago or something. It was like that Cobra Reggie's? Lunch. Or, oh, okay. no, I, no, I did see him there, so it wasn't that I long ago. I saw him at Reggie's, yeah. But uh, yeah, Deicide's the shit. Yeah, fuck yeah, they are. Glenn Benton's obviously out of his mind. They need the Hoffman brothers back in Deicide yeah. for sure, too. I do like the new Deicide records, though. Yeah. They sound Till fucking- Till Death to Us Part was the last one I bought or whatever. Oh, really? As a, I, as a while ago I, That is a while ago I like the ones after that Like there's To Hell With God Who they did with Mark Lewis So it sounds incredible Mark uh, Lewis is He used to work at Audio Hammer With Jason Sukoff He does Yeah Sukoff like, I know Yeah he's sure. done like a bunch of Black Dahlia records um, What else has he done He did a Cannibal Corpse record Mark Lewis He did a Skeletal Domain That one that came out in like 15 or uh, 14 yeah. Oh yeah um, He did that He did I want to say he did the last Deicide record. He's done stuff for Fallujah, Black. Did I already say Black Dahlia? He's done their stuff. Yes. Um, the Contortionist, I believe, he's done some shit with them. He's done stuff with a lot of bands, like Arsis. Um, I'm trying to think. I can't. I'm drawing blanks. There's huge ones I'm missing out on for sure. But yeah, cool. He makes those bands sound awesome. Yeah, and Deicide, the later newer records, from what I hear, they sound great. And actually, the yeah. original record sounded. Not great, but they were they sound, had a lot of attitude on them. Oh hell yeah, Legion! So what, Legion is, is so the sick. shit. And yeah. then actually, one of my favorites might be the first one, the self titled yeah, one. That one's awesome. Uh, Lunatic of God's Creation. Yeah, dun 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 dun. So sick, man. And then obviously, Suicide Sacrifice was a big song off that one. Yeah. Once upon the cross rules. Yeah, there's a decent song in the, light. in the Sopranos from Incinerate Him. I forget which yeah, song um, it is. It might be uh, Bible Basher. I don't know. Yeah, that's not be, yeah. Or uh, standing in the flames is the big one. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, man. And Serena him was the shit. So they, yeah, they're they're a cool band for sure. Yeah. All right, well, shit. Sure. <laughs> Do we have anything? Have else? you heard a Deicide song before, Bill? I'm sure I have, but I couldn't <laughs> pinpoint it. <laughs> I'm trying to think if you've seen them. No, you haven't. I've only seen them once. Deicide's a band you don't stumble into accidentally yeah. seeing. Like it's like a whole you pro- be production. Surprised with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, even Deicide, there are. You, again, they don't really play fests like they like a lot of those bands do, and they don't they don't play uh, definitely like an Oz fest or a Mayhem fest. They wouldn't even fuck with. Yeah. It's basically them headlining or no. Yeah. So they're they're very particular. Yeah. Shit. <laughs> maybe Bug one it. day. Yeah, maybe one day. 
Well, shit, guys. We got anything else to say about American Head Charge or any of these records? This was a fun week. Was a more fun of week. our. Uh, it's always I. We always kind of say that at the end of it, and we send it at the end yeah. of every week. Just good so eclectic re- group though of albums for sure. Reassure ourselves. Nice Next bag of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Really cool. Well, sick. Check out all these records. The yeah, rest. definitely check them out. American Head Charge, Mudvayne, and some motherfucking Slayer up in here. And who knows what we'll talk about next time? Have any of us done a Limp Biscuit record yet? Ooh, I don't think any of us. We're like waiting on that one. Yeah, same. I think yeah. It's like my my like last resort is like Limp really? Biscuit. Really? Right yeah. now, there's a Ooh. metaphoric pizza in front of us, and there's one slice left. And who's gonna grab that fucking right. slice? Yeah. <laughs> who's gonna have the fucking balls to fucking take the first? That'd be a fun. <laughs> the last slice. That'd be a fun talking. Yeah. Maybe, uh, all right, we'll, we'll see what's <laughs> we'll up. think about it, yeah. yeah. But uh, anything you want to plug while you're here? No. You I mean, we're, got go- a new record. we're, we're going gonna to the, we're going into the studio, um, and we're going to start it, and no shows, obviously, for any of, you know, anyone at this point, unless you're a fucking idiot playing um, Redneck Club USA in the middle yeah. of fucking nowhere for five people, and... <laughs> risking every, risking your life yeah. everyone's yeah. everyone's life in the club there's 10 people in a, it's like a joke there's 10 people in the club during covid they're all risking their lives yeah. to be there for a social experiment that show could be done at a house you know yeah. what i'm saying like or i don't even know there's more people that are on stage yeah. than the fucking whatever you gotta play gigs hell yeah what are you plugging i got nothing man i got nothing to plug this week uh i'm watching oz check it out it's on hbo <laughs> Max, if you guys have that, so I just got HBO Oz. Max. Or am I wings tired? <laughs> um, that's it. That's all I got. How you guys crush. You? Uh, same stuff. Check you out got, the bands. You guys shows show has been crushing lately. I'm stoked Thanks, for two weeks, where I believe Nate Madden's next oh, yeah. episode is coming yeah, up. We'll have the next yes. death metal episode. Um, he. I don't know if he's. When do you guys announce what records you're picking for that? Maybe a week or so. Two mm-hmm. weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, not next week, but the week after. I, it's hard. Did now he I'm tell you his pick? Um, no, but he said, Bill heard this. He comes over to my house to like um, have a drink every now and again. Uh-huh. He's over this week and he goes, your episode's this week. I go, yeah. He goes, shit, that means my episode's coming up. I need to think what I'm going to pick. Yeah. And I will say this, which is this, is, this should really put a fine point on how great this show has progressed over the last year, which is I, I shouldn't be talking. I shouldn't be a person talking about death metal at this point. Because it's not wrapped up in my life in any way like it once was. Sure. I'm starting to get back into it because of you guys' shit. Nice. So if I hear Nate ah, and dude. y'all talking about it, I'm like, I want to re-listen to... We just had a... a yeah. I want, I'm going to go home this week and fucking re-listen to some Deicide because I haven't thought about Incinerate Him in 10 years. Dude, man. Check out the last couple records. They're awesome. This is cool. Yeah. So that's what everyone listening to these, these things should take from them, which is we're talking about these new metal records. If you haven't heard them and you and we're, they're worth talking about for, and from our standpoint, check them out. Yeah, listen. And then to if them. you remember listening to them, re-listen. Yeah, See if you like them. Yeah, definitely. That's always a fun experiment. Like going back and be like, oh, I remember awesome. I like this. Do I still like this? Yeah. Yes, that is more awesome. often than not for me. I usually still like it. Hell yeah, <laughs> I usually like that too. You know? Sometimes it's hard to go back, which is a generic concept of life. Which is, yeah, if it wasn't, if you listen to it and it wasn't a good time for you, you might never like it. Sure. But um, sometimes, and then it's also, an, um, it sucks when you listen to something that you used to like, yeah. and you're like, this shit fucking blows. It was almost like you were, you're admitting that you made a huge tactical error at that <laughs> yeah, one point, and yeah. you were not smart. You know, It yeah. does it happen every now and then. You got to listen to a bad record to know a good record, though. Yeah. I know that for a fucking fact. Definitely, definitely. I think this American Head Charge one is a rare one for me, just because, like, like I said, it wasn't until later that I was like, oh, I really like this album <laughs> now yeah, it's more than wild. I ever did back then, which is funny. Hell yeah. I doubt that will happen too often, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, shit. Well, alrighty, guys. You heard it here. Mud Vane, some fucking American Head Charge, and some Slayer. Check it out, and we'll see you guys later. You guys rule. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks see you for guys. having me. Bye. Bye. Hey. Gobo here from the Something Is Waiting band and your pseudo new metal expert for Nothings For No One. If you liked what you heard, click like, click subscribe. We will be doing this every couple months, but Nothings For No One airs every week on this YouTube channel. And check it out and support these dudes and support all the great podcasts out there. Thanks.